121. So I think we're ready to go. Let's get, get started. Thanks everyone for coming tonight. Looking forward to your uh, department uh, information. So, and I believe Mr. Bagdasarian is up first. Yes. So I'm happy to be here to propose the budget for next year. Uh, the buildings that I'm primarily talking about are Town Hall, Public Works, Parks and Miscellaneous Buildings, Fort Williams Park Buildings, Thomas Morrow Library, Town Center Fire Station, Community Services, The Pool, Police Station, and Cape Cottage Fire Station. Um, for the most part, I see a lot of my lines are kind of like consumables, and it, it's almost like a mathematic equation, kind of seeing where we were now, and, um, and that's kind of how I looked at it for electricity and fuel. Um, the key lines are uh, contract and maintenance, which uh, on like the kind of the, the number line looks like contract maintenance. That's, that's really any maintenance person that is, that's our HVAC people, that's window repair, that's HVAC controls, fire alarms, basically anything that we're not handling for repairs in-house falls under that line. Uh, maintenance supply line is anything that our in-house team is using for maintenance of the building. And um, you'll see that. And so uh, this budget really is uh, to keep our buildings uh, running as they are now. Um, and I'll talk more about that at the end, but I'm going to keep moving right ahead. And um, we can start on page 124. There's no changes there. That's kind of the the um, kind of like the business office section, basically. Um. David, mm -hmm. sorry, I just took me a while to get organized. Yeah. Um, I just want to just um, on page 122, mm -hmm. 122, 122, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I just, there's this statement here that I always like to try to highlight that um, uh, when I see numbers of seven million dollars, that that's over time. I don't want people who out there in the yep. general public who are reading this to think you've got seven million dollars in one year. So yeah, I'll touch base, I was gonna wait till the end, but we, you're right, might as well touch base with that now. Um, at the end of this meeting last year, Penny kind of gave uh, me the charge of wanting to have a really nice kind of color-coded CIP plan for basically the next 10 years, similar to what Jay has at Public Works. Um, and so we went ahead and had a updated uh, assessment, a needs assessment from the 2012 Harriman report, which was a great report. Um, and we were able to get this done at a fraction of the cost of what a normal needs assessment was done. And uh, it did take them some time to get the report done, and we didn't really get the final vi version until December, um, which is why it's not included in here. We really haven't had time to vet these projects and include them. It does look like this, just like you wanted, color-coded, and uh, goes across the 10-year period and will be included in next year's budget report, um, which is, you know, it's great to have this because we didn't have that and um, to have this listed. Um, the estimated cost here of $7 million is actually closer to nine millions. I, I caught a, a, an error they made on one of their estimates. So, you know, I think that shouldn't really surprise people. These buildings, uh, for the most part, are all old buildings, this building in particular. Um, the public works, police, and fire were basically all renovated or built around the same period, and they're all kind of at that 20 plus age mark where um, systems are starting to break down. So there is going to be some needed um, CIP improvements, heating systems failed, um, updated fire panels. Um, so there is quite a bit here, but we didn't include it this year. Like I said, I want to vet these projects, make sure the numbers are in here. Um, some things in this report that came in are things that I plan on taking care of uh, through either a climate action plan, uh, climate action grant that I'll touch, talk about at some point today. And um, a lot of these things I, I plan on taking, actually doing during the, um, my operational budget. But so people should know there is, there is a number here. These are not immediate things. If anything was immediate, it would have been included in this year's budget. Um, in fact, I would say 
The buildings this year across the board are in maybe the best shape they've been in in a while. We had a fantastic heating year across all the buildings. Um, this building used to always be either hot or cold. We had a really consistent um, heating year. Wasn't the coldest winter either, which helped. Um, but we've done a lot of work um, with our HVAC systems, particularly the HVAC controls, which really, um, you know, make the comfort level work. You know, when you actually you want 70 degrees, it, it hits 70 and keeps 70. But um, but yeah, so that's a big number. Uh, but no one should be scared. None of these are immediate things, and next year this will be included, and I'll make sure you all have a copy of this. So for each of those items, I know I've talked to Matt and Christy about this. For the items that we have in CIP, I'm assuming that we uh, are creating this kind of notebook of here's here's the here's the building here's its age here are the things that need to be done and here is the sequence in which we envision them being done yeah yeah so uh we have a it's exactly what i have um and on the cip plan you'll see the there's three different uh, urgency levels mm -hmm. and they're all kind of bracketed things that we should take you know i think it's one to four four to six or seven and then things that can kind of on the back burner of that 10 year period. Right. Um, so we do have that and I will get that to all of you. That's great. I, and, and the reason I just, I keep talking about this is that in many of the town council meetings, especially as we're going through budget, et cetera, um, um, there, are, there are comments about the fact that, or the feeling that we don't have our arms around our capital improvements for municipal and or school. And uh, we have it, and you've got it, and you're working it. I've and so I just want people out there to know that we have our arms around what's needed from a CIP perspective uh, for our buildings. Absolutely. I, everyone should feel good about that. You gave the charge, and um, this document answers that. And if people want to feel good about things, looking at our 10-year um, our CIP project list that was in place when I took over, um, I've probably knocked off everything that was in the facilities department on this. You might have seen it. It was the FY 2020 to FY 2029 CIP project list. Um, and almost every single thing that was in there when I took over has been completed and normally at a fraction of the cost. Um, you know, one of those things is adding a new sleeping quarters at, at the fire department. It was budgeted for 75,000. I'm gonna get it done for under 10. So mm -hmm. I've probably saved the town over a million dollars on the current CIP project list that we had. Um, so people should feel good about that we are as a town taking, at, we are attacking the CIP list as we had and now we have a new plan yeah. uh, for the next 10 year period. Yeah. That's why we love you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so let's let David make his presentation and maybe we could hold questions until he's finished. All right, so uh, page 124 is basically just like my office uh, expenses, which might be advertising, if we needed to advertise for a position, mileage if I needed to travel somewhere, um, dues and memberships, I'm a, I have a couple uh, kind of like trade memberships. Uh, no changes there at all. Um, the next is Town Hall. So Town Hall is the building with the largest increase. Overall is about a just under $50,000 increase from this year to last year. Um, the reason there is that is this building is old and we've continued to run up into unexpected expenses. Um, just this past year, we had the main the water line break. Um, you know, no one planned for that, and during that, we discovered that the water line was over 100 years old. So, um, my approach here is to add more money to the contracted maintenance. Um, you know, this year already, we spent $66,000 in this building, and none of those were you know luxury improvements. Those were all needed fixes. So. Um, it was a similar strategy that I've, I've taken with the school recently, uh, not knowing what the future holds for the school at the time, is to be able to have more money available to attack any um, emergent repairs that may happen. Um, as you're gonna hear from Matt, I think today or later on, there's 
you know, potential talks about the, what the future of this building might look like. Um, so at that point, you know, major changes uh, would probably be included in that CIP project. So by adding additional money into that maintenance line, uh, it will help us. We do have a, a steam boiler down below that is uh, at its age um, ex expectancy life. We did have its service and uh, really completely taken apart and rebuilt and in service, but it's running great, but that's one of those things that could literally fail next year and it wouldn't be a surprise, and that would be about a $38,000 fix, just that one thing. So by having a little more money uh, on town hall, I feel like anything that comes up, I'll be ready, be ready and um, able to, to attack. Um, like I said, this building continues to have uh, weird needs, and there's also so many things that could be improved, you know, None of the wood floors have been finished in a long time. There's painting that's needed. You guys have been in a Jordan conference room. You've seen, you know, there's, there's, there's needs here. Um, so that really overall in my whole budget is the biggest building with the largest increase. Um, other than that, everything is more or less the, long, more or less the same. I, I decreased the maintenance supply line significantly from last year. I had it at 18,000 down to five just trying to bring that number down, um, you know, to see if, you know, if, if we need to do, if we, we're gonna do it our in-house. I wanna have money available for this building to be able to help. Um, next is public works. The difference in that building is just over $8,000. Um, there is an increase in ma maintenance contract, uh, contracted work um, every year, Our Everyone who works here basically has about, adds about a 5% uh, increase to their prices. Um, and that building is also at that, you know, 20 year plus mark where things could start to go. We had a circulator pump fail today. Um, so having a little bit more money is, uh, there is nice. But um, for the most part, I was able to decrease um, fuel. Did I de decrease fuel here? Maybe I didn't. No, I didn't. But. Um, Electricity is down, there are a few things down, but overall that building's up a little over 8,000. Next is uh, parks and miscellaneous buildings and, and green space among, in town. Um, was able to decrease that by uh, almost $10,000 um, by just looking at what we're using and budgeting and we, and it just, uh, that one came down. So not everything went up. Keep going. Spurwing Church, that one's actually up 5,000. Uh, it needs some minor repairs, some painting. Um, recently, the wind vane fell down, and we're trying to rehab that in house that, um, and get that back up. But uh, that building, while it's not really used that much, it's, it does take a beating. It's in a tough area on that corner. This is the first winter that I've worked here that no one's crashed into it. Um, so even though it's just sitting there, there is some expenses that do come with that. Over to Fort Williams, this also is a, um, this is a decrease of a little over 5,000. The majority of that comes from the water and sewer. Just weren't seeing, seeing the, same, the same usage this year um, on that line. The library is next, Thomas Morrill Library. That's up uh, $3,000. Most part of that is um, just some maintenance supplies. We're always trying to keep that building looking fresh. The building always looks great when you walk in there, but nothing too crazy there. Spurwing School Building, which is the old children's library. Um, you know, we do heat it. Um, it is used for storage. Um, there is some expenses that come with that. There's electricity. Um, you know, we just repaired the fence, uh, or the, the little porch, because that was completely dilapidated and kids were jumping on it. We had to repair that to make sure it's safe. But so, you know, that and the Spurwind Church, while they're not heavily used buildings, there are some costs that come with them. And then we have Town Center, Town Center Fire Station. That one, I have a decrease of $10,000. Majority of that's coming in fuel savings. Um, 
you haven't been there, the place looks great. Did the flake floor last year in the bay. And we, this year, replaced and uh, were able to repair the entire heating system in the bay, which was, we were able to do it a fraction of the cost. Um, it has a huge, giant heater in the system, and we had a pretty good, um, worked out a pretty good system with Siemens where we purchased the heater, and then, then they was paid for labor for them to install it. it saved us a ton of money on that. So uh, Steve, Chief Steve over there, Chief Young is, is quite happy with how that building is looking. Then we're at Community Services, Community Center building. That is another building like Town Hall that is old and has issues come up that we're not always prepared for. This building has an increase of $22,000. Um, it's very similar, my thought on this, it's just like here. There are issues that could arise at any moment. It's a very old building. Um, you know, in the CIP plan, you'll see that, you know, most of the heating, heating units in the classrooms are at or past their service life and need to replace, be replaced in the future. Currently, they're holding heat well and producing heat and things are good, but I just wanna be able to, to react and not have to come here asking for money that we don't have in the budget to solve issues, especially considering those are classrooms and this kind of a sensitive area. Um, on the CIP list, you'll see that um, they have two um, oil furnaces that, uh, you know, they should have three years left. Once again, though, if one of them went, I wanna be able to, to respond. Um, so that's the second biggest increase in a building is that, that building, and if you've been there, I mean, that was a, I think it was a wood mill when I was a child, and um, you know, one good thing is half the building is relatively new due to the uh, disaster last year when there was a huge water leak there, but um, there is quite a bit of an increase there. Pool, um, slight increase on maintenance supplies. Um, there's some things that I'm, um, some upgrades that could be needed there. Uh, there's some flooring needs. There's some uh, door issues. Um, and all those things cost a lot. Um, that was another building that uh, Penny, you gave me a charge to try to, to work on last year. And um, we actually have been able to have a great year in the pool this year. One of the biggest changes is trying to maintain an 84 degree temperature air around the pool. So the pool is at 82. And if the room is at 84, you don't get that heat loss. What we don't want is the pool heating the room. And by having um, better compliance with everyone keeping the pool area shut, um, we've really seen a really stable year this year. Um, as someone who goes in the pool almost weekly, I, I'm feeling it myself. It's, you know, it's, it's consistently at the right temperature, it feels good. Um, I remember as a child, I always thought the pool was cold, but um, that's not the case anymore. And, um, you know, it's, the pool is not a, uh, it's, it's a lot of money to operate a pool and a pool that size, but it's a luxury. And I, I think it's a huge benefit and an asset to this town. I mean, you see the usage there. Um, I, you know, even though it costs money, I think it's a great asset to this town. And with that, um, there's an expense. Police station, just about a little over $4,000 increase. Um, but a significant decrease in electricity of um, $20,000. Um, we just painted out the entire police station with our own maintenance crew, and um, they, you know, both the police and fire chief have really good visions of where they want their, their stations to look and uh, to try to meet, meet them where they want to be. There's a lot of repairs. We have a really talented maintenance team, um, but there's a lot of things that we want to handle in-house, fixed carpets. They have their locker room gets a lot of use and could use um, some attention. So uh, not a big increase there, but there's a little increase. Lastly is Cape Cottage Fire Station. Um, that actually has an increase of $8,000. Um, and that mostly is in line with the chief. The chief has a vision of that department, um, a little bit uh, different than the, the former chief. Um, he really wants that building to, to feel nice and new, and um, he has plans 
he has plans for that building to be used uh, slightly different and, and more, and he wants to make that building ready to uh, last the future. And um, if you haven't been in that building, it's it's old. I that really old, 1930s old, maybe even older than that. So um, you know, it hasn't really seen too much love, but we're going to try to get that where the chief wants it. Um, overall, with all those up, all those changes, it's roughly about an $81,000 increase from last year's budget. Um, the majority of that, I mean, more than half of that, or about half of that, was at town hall. The other is community services. It reflects about a six point six and a half percent increase. Um, given that, you know, normal um, building escalation costs year after year, if you're playing a project long term on a CIP, is around six percent. Um, I feel like that's right in line where you, you kind of want to be. Um, you know, I tried to look at it, you know, with a very um, mathematical brain, and I was looking at, you know, a lot of the, the consumables of the energy and the fuel. Um, you know, something you guys should know is there are some things that here that I, I wasn't able to factor in that should be kind of exciting is, one, we have a solar field coming on next year. It's going to significantly uh, impact our electricity costs across the town. And then also, we just this week secured a new kilowatt hour rate of, we went from 13 and, a half, 13 and a half cents per kilowatt hour down to nine cents. It's a 34% reduction in our kilowatt, um, and that's for the entire town. That's going to signify uh, based on last year's consumption, over 250K in savings. Um, it's not straight town versus school, but it's a significant savings for everyone. Um, so that said, even though I reduce electricity costs a, a lot in here, there actually is some buffer in these numbers, and we haven't locked in our fuel cost either. Um, that said, I like to think of all the budgets having some extra money in the facilities budget, out of all the budgets, I think, is not a bad thing to have. Um, and, you know, knowing that we have CIP projects, I'd like to, if there are carryovers uh, from this year due to those kind of unplanned electricity and fuel savings, I would suggest that those are continuing to move forward into facility CIPs. Um, or that savings, you know, I probably won't even know the savings because that rate doesn't change till December, so that, that 9% uh, new rate starts in December, so we'll see, we'll see that for half the year. Um, but I, at the time when I made this, I didn't, I didn't know that reduction. Um, other things to be mindful of is we have the Climate Action Plan uh, that's going to be completed soon. That will probably be a, um, a guiding star for my department more than most as we try to make um, decisions that are both energy efficient and kind of match the state's plan of trying to remove, get yourself off fossil fuels by 2050. Um, what does that look like? It could, you know, instead of heating the pool with propane and oil, um, there's potential that we could get an electric uh, heater for the pool, and run the whole thing off electric, which, you know, you wouldn't do that, you wouldn't probably do that in your house, but when we have a solar field off offsetting our costs, it could be a really interesting thing. And when we finish the climate action plan, we're joining this um, group where basically every six months we have an opportunity to get a 50K grant, which is pretty exciting. Um, if we have a project that aligns with basically anything green or energy efficient. Um, one of the first ones we're gonna be targeting and submitting uh, at the end of this month is to, trans uh, to retrofit this building, police, and there's only a couple lights at the fire department to LED lights which should further reduce our energy usage um, while also, you know, helping the building occupants. LED lights is such a cleaner light. Um, there's a lot of benefits to doing that, but I think that's kind of cool. 50K is not anything to, you know, that's a decent number that we can do things with. And I think that will help us, um, you know, really accomplish some of our bigger goals in the CIP. Um, other things to note, while the Ice rink is not a town asset yet. Um, they're using more electricity than we ever had thought before, more than they had ever known either. And it's something that you guys should be aware of as we move forward. 
well, it's a great asset for the, I think it would be a great asset for the town. I love the ice rink. But um, the usage of the ice rink alone is as much as the entire town, not counting the, the school. Um, that could de greatly be reduced by having a roof and kind of their future plan would make it so it's not ex so exposed. Um, and they will also see a 34% reduction in their, in their rate next year too, so they should see a savings too. Um, but yeah, so questions? We have a bunch. You go first, Jeremy. Do you have some? I have one, but why don't you go first? Oh, okay. I shall. <laughs> okay. Um, you kind of started to allude to one of my uh, questions uh, when you said the ice rink uses probably as much electricity as the town. One of my questions was, and I think I, I asked this last year as well, what is the total electricity bill for the town across all of the um, facilities? So, Excluding the school. Uh, <laughs> I know the total kilowatt number is around, you know, 2.5 million kilowatt hours. What that breaks down to, I, I don't know, but I can get that to you. I have it in a spreadsheet. That would be great. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is, is that I think you started to answer this one as well, and um, I'm not 100% sure when the solar um, arrays will come online. Um, and I see that uh, the, the pool, we know that uses a lot of electricity, and you said that it was less because of some actions that were taken. Do you have handy what the 2023 actuals were for electricity for the pool? So that, so very weirdly enough, and I'm working on getting this separated, currently we get one CMP bill that encompasses the middle school, the elementary school, the high school, and the pool. So part of the CIP plan for both, well, part of the CIP plan that was identified for the town and the school, although together it'd be a really one project, is to get the, the high school onto the power coming off 77 um, and break it off that. Uh, I'm waiting on the meters to have everything broken out. Um, so uh, I have a better sense of the pool and I could, I could um, I can kind of get a very good estimate on what the pool electrical usage, um, but it's very odd that we haven't known that. And there kind of has been more or less an agreement among the, the school on like a percentage. Like, um, so like currently when we get a CMP, CMP bill, uh, it's like a 60-40 split and it's blown blanking on whether the middle school, elementary school pays that or the high school. and. You know, there are some costs in here that are, um, that are done kind of like in a discussion format, the custodial uh, rates, and then there are some transfers um, for electricity because it, it's jointly connected. Um, I could probably show you on the pool. So the pool currently, um, the, reduc that, the reduction that we're seeing with the heating being stabilized is actually more reflective of the fuel um, and my hope is in the future that, that, that electricity would heat it. Um, so let's see. Those don't show there either. Um, but yeah, so that is, that's just a weird thing that we're dealing with. Okay. Um, my other thing, and maybe this is more of a, uh, a, a Matt question, but how did the prioritization of the, uh, Cape Cottage uh, fire station get into, because Stevie didn't, I'm sorry, Chief Young did not uh, say anything about that. Not that I'm wicked opposed to it, but uh, if we are take, making the decision that because this building has set for a number of years with no love, just mm -hmm. like you say, we have another building that also has that same type of problem which is sitting there deteriorating. And um, my question around the Spurwink School is, what are we doing to ensure that it doesn't deteriorate to the point where 
we just say it's not worth any investment. Right. Uh, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Uh, th thanks for the question, Councilor Jordan. So looking at Cape Cottage, we'll start there first. Uh, speaking with Stevie, was, oh, sorry, with Chief Young last week, sorry, he got me in and out of it too. Uh, within the past couple of weeks is where we've been, uh, I know he's, he's brought that up as uh, he'd like to see some more investment into that, mostly because uh, South Portland's Willard's, Willard Station is one that we've talked about in the past. Of, and, and in the future, I think there may be an opportunity to work, you know, with combined efforts on that in the future. However, that's on that's on leased land, as well. I did not what? know. I did not know that the Willard Station itself was on is on a leased leased property. The city doesn't own that parcel. Right, right. We've talked about that for years. Yeah, going, I, I didn't and, know that was on yeah. leased. So, so talking with Chief Young about that, he said, "Well, <clears throat> you know, we need to do that." In, Eventually, we may graduate to the point that we have shared, you know, shared assets, shared coverage, things along those lines that we can, because a, a lot of the folks who we've had in the call company historically have come from that section uh, of town, and so there's been a quick response when it comes to fire issues, but also thinking that you know the long term we'll be collaborating in that region, but in the short term or the near term, that we need to at least maintain that. We do have a, a, a you know nice apparatus there, so we want to make sure that the building surrounding it doesn't come down around it and and put some you know put some investment into that, so we don't have catastrophic failures take place. So that's kind of what I'm not that. I'm not opposed to that. I think I it was sad that we uh, kind of neglected that side of town for a number of years because we really should have some sort of presence over there because it's a long drive from here to from here, from there. here to there. So I'm glad Steve's thinking about that. That's good. And then on the Spurwing School, as, as David had said, the uh, you know we just replaced the, the front porch. Uh, we do we do heat it. We do you know we have had people go through it fairly regular, especially the past the past three years, uh, just because unoccupied buildings, as you know, deteriorate quickly. So we have had training we, we've used it for different training operations on the policeman side. Uh, the SWAT team have done some active training in there. Uh, fire and rescue have done a lot of active training through the building. Others have used it at different times for uh, ad additional space needs as, as needed. So uh, we've, we've tried to at least get a, like a fairly regular rotation through there. So you know, having eyes in the building has helped. Uh, but long term, I know Dr. Record has had some conversations with me thinking about you know either potential for you know for pre-k and eventually go there or uh, different special uh, special education programming that may go there or there's another I can't remember the I'm, I'm not an education person but there's another program that they run on the elementary side that they've looked at because they they have some space you, know, you and I and, and Councillor Thompson spent a lot of time they have some space needs on certain programs that he's looked at that as a, as an option as well so that's been a conversation that we've had over the past year. Uh, if that doesn't evolve further, uh, I, you know, just throwing something out there as a thought, uh, you know, affordable housing needs in the community, if you want to convert it into a two unit, you know, that, that could happen pretty well too, because just by the space, you could turn that into a residential housing mm -hmm. as another option. That would probably be the lesser expensive of, of mm -hmm. all the approaches, but that's, that, those are kind of, Kind of the ideas, but we have had in the in the near term, we have had people through there, so we do try to keep eyes on it. And I know David uh, is a regular visitor uh, to it as well, especially during the winter months. You know the experiences we've had in the past couple of years with our facilities and boilers and catastrophic failures. That's one of those things you, you just got to watch over them to see to make sure everything's operating. And this is my last question. I just wanted to add to that. Oh. Um, so I've been thinking about that building a lot too. And on the school side of things, I've actually um, worked with um, Joseph Shalott, he's the architect behind the IGA, and I actually have a blueprint, about a 30% completed um, plan for what it would take to convert the top floor, which is the only usable floor. The, first, the bottom floor can only be used for storage due to the height. Um, but I actually have a pretty nice plan on if the school thing were not to go the way we want it to in November, on how to make that into um, usable space. It's about 2,500 square feet. And so 
um, you know, if, if funds came available, um, there is a plan on what it would look like to turn that into basically a meeting space, um, some breakout spaces, and also moving the bathrooms from the basement to the first floor. So it's kind of like a backup plan, and it would be a, a nicer alternative than paying for portables if we were to run out of space for the school, because a portable alone, when you get all the hookups, can be 400K plus, um, where I don't know what this would cost to get this, but there already is a lot of good features in there. To sprink it already has sprinklers in there. It has a lot of things you would need right off the bat. Um, so we do kind of, on the school side, have a backup plan. Obviously, we would need the, the town to, to be on board. But so I am thinking about that building. That's awesome. Thank mm. you. And I have just one last question, yep. only because, and Matt probably knew I was going to ask this. So the Spring Church is near and dear to my heart, and I watched that spire go like mm. this. So, and there's more going on up there than just putting a weather vane back up yeah. there. So what's the timing of when we're going to see that? So the, the you know, it fell off. We had, we had a plan to get it removed for a while. Um, part of the problem is it is, it's, well, it's higher than it looks up there, and it's also in. So um, before it actually fell, they came out with a lift, and that lift just went straight up. Mm -hmm. But they really need to go up and in. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was unfortunate that we didn't catch it. Um, that was a week where we had a storm on like a Sunday night and then again on like a Wednesday. And uh, it survived Sunday night. It didn't survive Wednesday. Um, currently, we're rehabbing it. Um, it's, there's, so there's like a, a compass on it mm -hmm. and this big round ball. Mm -hmm. And that ball is not in good shape. And then there's a fish. And so currently, one of our maintenance guys is kind of rehabbing it. So when it goes back up there, it'll be shinier than ever. Um, it's also way bigger than it looks, too, and heavy. Um, and it may require a crane on top of having a lift for, so that they can actually get it in there. Like something to hold the, the weather vane up and then also have people meet up there to put it in. Um, but it's already, it's, they're right now, the only, they're waiting, uh, the company is waiting for us to rehab the weather vane before we put it up. But so it's, it's on us to do that. So soon, hopefully sooner than later, um, you know, today would have been a bad day. Jeremy? Um, thank you. Uh, on that, I also just uh, wonder if it might be worth, if we've looked into alternative funding sources um, for that, uh, it strikes me that that might be something that's eligible for funding through Maine Community Foundation's Belvedere Fund, uh, especially if there's some additional shoring up work that needs to happen. So we actually submitted it for FEMA funding. Okay. Um, whether that gets approved or not, I don't know, but uh, we did submit the invoice for that work to be covered under that. Okay. Um, with that, we're gonna, we're gonna work on getting it up as fast as we can and then see where that goes. But yeah, that could be an interesting way to look. Um, the other um, question I have, so thank you for the narrative and I'm pleased to see, a, you know, the improved capital improvement plan and all of those costs forecast out over time. I guess one of the things that I am still trying to figure out sort of across the board with facilities is um, just looking at the level, I, and I appreciate the approach you've taken this year to including some additional contingency funding for our older buildings, just recognizing that, you know, things happen. Uh, but I, I'm still struggling to try and figure out on that sort of regular maintenance schedule what the appropriate level of annual funding allocations we should be putting into that is. and. You know, I know on the commercial side, there's pretty well-developed rules of thumbs around asset valuation and how much you should be putting into maintenance based on the, mm -hmm. the asset value. Um, I, don't, I don't believe that we're maintaining an asset valuation table, but I'm wondering what your thoughts are. Like, I, I'd like to have a sense of like, are we, I, I don't think we're overfunding maintenance. <laughs> But I, I don't have a benchmark to measure that against, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are on how we could. So if, if, if I had to guess, we are significantly underfunding um, the buildings. Normally, it's 2% of your insurance uh, replacement value, CRV, I think it's called. Um, so it's the, um, build, it's, the, it's the building value, not counting the land. And normally, it's, it's supposed to be 2% of that value number. 
And you know, early on it can be a lot less. So if we built a new school, ideally the first 10 years, your capital costs are only gonna maybe be a fraction of that. And then on the back end, it could get up where closer to 10. Um, so for a building like this, you know, this was de would definitely be, you know, in the million dollar range. Um, what would, you know, so you'd be looking at at least probably closer to 10% for a building this old with radiators. Um, and we're only budgeting for the entire building for facilities 50,000. You know, it, you know I, would, I would say we're under, we're under funding. So, so I guess that would, and I, I, for future years, I think that would be a helpful thing to note in the narrative, you know, like, to the extent that we have those insured uh, replacement values, just noting the, the relative maintenance budget compared to the, built, the asset valuation, I think would give the council a nice benchmark to try and understand where we, we maybe need to be investing more in regular maintenance in order to just keep up with yeah. the anticipated needs. Y yeah, it's, um, so I've done this more on the, on the school side and what, you, what you've learned from that exercise is it becomes quite challenging because I, I can also find out how much we've underfunded it over the past. So, you know, for the school, I know over the last five years, it was probably underfunded by about $7 million in, in uh, you know, facility costs based on that kind of 2% rule. So then it comes, to, so then if you try to right the ship, it, yeah. it's almost near impossible without, you know, a, a referendum. Um, but it would be interesting um, to get all those um, to, I, could, I, could, I can make that an exercise to get those uh, replacement costs and show you what 2% looks like. I, I think maybe even outside of our regular budgeting timetable, mm -hmm. it might be useful for the council to, to have that type of an analysis and start to make some decisions in terms of long range forecasting around what do we, you know, how, what, what, what do we want to do? What are our options in terms of writing the ship? Because, you know, mm. As you've noted, I, I think we have been underinvesting in maintenance for a while. Um, so, yeah. And just to add to that too, and then also um, to compound that, we have buildings like Public Works and the Police that were built almost the exact same time, and so, you know, there's a, there's a lifespan for the, all those things, and they, they kind of all become due at around the same time. Yeah. But um, I know exactly what you're looking for, and I can produce something like that. Thank you, David. Who's next? <laughs> Community services is next. Thank you, Kathy. Um, so. More on page 138. I'm sorry. Yes, 138. So we're doing, uh, at community services, we're doing very, very well. And there's been a lot of changes within our department based on the public preschool coming in, um, some staffing changes. but. Overall, they're um, exceeding our revenue goals and our programming goals. Uh, if you look at the narrative, it kind of explains where the money has gone. We added in um, our youth programming has grown and grown and grown, and that's a real credit to Susan Frost, who is a part-time employee. And at best, that's a time and a half position. So. We brought on um, a new person, Dana Hatton, who graduated from Cape Elizabeth High School. And we kind of reassessed and split the, two, the youth programming. So one will do the sports programs and one will do the enrichment type programs. And um, that's working out. We're kind of in the transition phase right now and she's acclimating herself to that. In the other departments, in the fitness center, we changed out a bunch of equipment. So you see the change, the use of the equipment outlay and that was reduced for next fiscal year because once you get that equipment in, obviously you don't need to continue to replace it. In the pool, we did um, replaced the inflatable and we've recouped that cost as I knew we would very, very quickly. We we booked that out so far in advance that right now we're booking into July and then it closes for August when the, during the annual closure. So very, very popular um, and no problem recouping that money. Additionally, we um, took a look at the Blue Fish, which was formerly CMA Swim Club, and their rental fees, and we met with them and agreed with them, and in January, we increased their hourly rate for the use of the pool. Additionally, during 
the spring, uh, the, right when we reopened last year, South Portland closed their pool and we reached an agreement with some of the people from South Portland and Matt was involved in bringing in some, um, some of their programming into our facility. They paid their instructors, we took the revenue that was generated from that and it was a nice working arrangement. So we increased our um, memberships as a result of that as well because they couldn't utilize their pool and Bluefish or formerly CMA uses the pool much more as a result because they had their younger swimmers that were swimming there. So the pool, <coughs> excuse me, the pool is, is doing very, very well. Andrew continually comes up with programs. We had water polo, tube polo, and then transitioned a group came into us and we do now water polo. So we're offering both. One is much more difficult than the other if you've ever <laughs> tried them. Um, but it's great, you know, it's great to get just new and different programs in the pool. We have been bringing in um, some special needs programs in the Portland school system come in and they've been using the pool and we work out a time that works nicely with them. So the only opportunity that we have right now in the pool is our private swim lessons. So we're trying to work on, out a good program on how to do that. We have always set it up that people had to come through us, that we set up the private swim lessons and then the in instructors fill out the form, we come up with an agreed time and we pay them a, a percentage of that money. We're trying to control those that come in because so many people want private swim lessons. So we're trying to control that um, with the given time frames that we allow and when people are doing lap swimming, they don't want little kids swimming in the loop. So it's just trying to meet all the needs of all the pool users. So that will be coming in the very near future because I know people keep calling me for it, so it'll be happening. Um, in our adult programs, um, that is together with our senior programs. So that's Linda Strunk and Jane Anderson. And Jane has a, a, different, a couple different hats that she wears, but she oversees the senior programs and then all of the um, marketing, all of our social media, all of that type. And she does all the courier articles and everything that goes into the, that side of the world. Linda does all of the adult programming, whether it be exercise or enrichment programs and all of that. So, and she gets all the sounds by the sea performers and she contracts with them and, and handles that side of the world. Additionally, she is going to, she's looking into us becoming a passport um, provider or assistance as they do in Scarborough. They just get all of the information and they send it off to the state and get people's passports working. Uh, we kind of have taken an interest in that and Linda's doing some research on that and she's going to Scarborough tomorrow to meet with them to see how to get us as a doing that as well. So she's going to be doing that. Our youth programs, as I said, they grow and grow and grow. I think the only thing that's inhibiting us there is the actual space that we can offer these programs. We, with the preschool at our end of the building, there's two classrooms that are public pre-K and then one preschool classroom. At that end of the building, there's only two other rooms. And so there's a meeting room and a living room and those are used um, by our aftercare and our before care program. So the only space that we have for actual activities in our building are the kitchen, the activity room, which is the wooden floor room that was damaged and was repaired. And the downstairs below that, which is where the garage doors are, it used to be our, we refer to it still as our spin room, but it has no more spin bikes in it. Um, different types of exercise kind of come and go, and we put a new flooring in there, and it's now used, it's a multi-purpose room that we can use a lot of different things in there, whether it be karate or dance or science or whatever the classes are. So we've completely utilized our building. We have been working with the schools and they've been great about us using certain rooms within the school buildings, but adult programming doesn't want to go up to schools. So we're, we're trying to, that's the only thing that's holding us back really is where we would offer things because we have a huge number of programs. Every day after school we service probably between 100 and 150 kids a day that we either take to after school activities or to our aftercare program. Um, the aftercare program has 50 kids on average a day and then we probably have 100 other kids going to different programming. So very, very busy. Susan does not like to have wait lists. She oversees this majority. She feels badly when people end up on a wait list, you know, and so she'll try to come up with another day of that same program or another 
opportunity for people. So that's sometimes why the revenue is far greater in the youth programming than the what I can expect because she'll just keep adding these things. Um, obviously the contracted services is up as a result as well because we have to pay the different instructors that run those classes, but it's it's a very fair break there. And then they have we have the um, we have our summer camp employees that are all teenagers and work in this and work in our aftercare program and the minimum wage went up and so we were impacted by that as well so in January and that will impact us this summer for our summer camp the Cape care that's the umbrella for our before and after care program and our preschool which is three and four year old and the public pre-k which is the four to five year olds um, we are getting funding from the state for that um, because of the public pre-k aspect of it it's just like a, a student in a school system there's an allocation that comes in and by the number of students by our 30 students um, and then we had a grant that came in as additionally that covers some of the renovations that had to take place in the building those supplies that had to be purchased increase in uh, some of the staffing uh, salaries as well as the staff themselves so all in all, the um, public pre-K has been very, very successful, as is our preschool with the three and four-year-olds. And we've been fortunate both years with the, to be able to transition or grandfather the kids that went to our three and four-year-old program into the public pre-K program. The state allows that, and then it leaves the remaining spots to be filled through application. And if you go over the 30 students, then we would have had to do a lottery in both years. We were at 30 students and did not have to do the lottery. So. No disappointment there, and we're happy that it's filled. So we really came out well that way. On here, the Spur Week Church, in, under the community services portion, is just for the rental portion when people have weddings or um, funerals there. They were down quite a bit last year. Um, first year it was a little bit busy, and then last year it was significantly reduced. We're hoping to utilize it again. We've had a few inquiries coming in, um, so we do need the things looking that way. I know, I know you're working on it. Um, and then at the Fort Williams Park portion of this is for um, the rangers, the greeters, and supplies for them. We have to get new uniforms for them. Just small expenses under the Fort Williams Park portion of it. So on, as we go through, it breaks it down just by that individually through you know the community services administration which there's no huge surprises in any of that it's pretty spelled out in the sub ledgers that you can read um, the only I don't think there's any major difference in anywhere on the community services administration portion of it so that's where that one is the fitness center as I said, we had equipment outlay that we have utilized this year, so it's been reduced for next year. Um, and the miscellaneous contracts, um, that again coincides with the classes that we offer, the revenue that we bring in, than what we have to pay out to instructors. So that will remain pretty standard. The pool. Um, The biz biggest expense there is um, obviously the maintenance of the pool. We try to bring in as much revenue from it as, as possible, and then we in turn have to pay some of the expenses that go along with it, but they're pretty spelled out there. There's um, the part-time employee is all of the lifeguards that we have throughout uh, the year. They change, consist, you know, their kids, they come and go, and we try to bring them in, the, and the minimum wage goes up and that increases it. And then in the summertime, we have more lifeguards because of summer camp that we run so that would be that under professional services that is the contracts for the pool portion of it if we have offer classes within the pool we have to pay the instructors and that's where that falls is that oh the equipment outlay for the pool reduced because we purchased the new inflatable so that will last probably 10 years so we don't have to buy that again the adult programs um, increase in revenue expected there so with that increase in the miscellaneous con uh, the contracts that we pay out no other major changes in the adult programs portion in the youth programs 
It correlates to the revenue and what we're going to have to pay out in our miscellaneous contracts, our part-time employees. Um, in all of that, that's our, our major cost is the staffing and the employees that we have. And then under Cape Care, we should stay about flat. We'll have the um, preschool and the pre-K as is the aftercare has about 50 kids a day and the pre before care has about 25 kids and that's standard. So no increases greatly there other than the part-time employees that we pay. Nothing major for Spur Rink Church. And then as I said, the Fort Williams Park portion, this portion of the, is the operational and just our seasonal employees and some basic expenses that come with that. Some things that we have been involved in that have been, you know, we wanna to continue to be community services and keeping our town active. So we've been involved in the movie nights, the trunk or treat. Um, the, we did an instructor appreciation week, um, which was nice, you know, we have an instructors, we pay them, yes, but it's nice to have the participants be able to recognize them and. We did a lot of little activities and did things with them and, and they really appreciated it. And so it's nice to keep that relationship going. So we did that. We did the sledding celebration at Fort Williams Park, um, which did very, very well. The fireworks with the rotary and something that we're gonna offer, um, we haven't landed on the final date, continues to change for whatever reason, is a, every year at Portland Headlight, the second Saturday in September, they do um, open lighthouse day and those tickets go extremely fast. And what we're gonna do is a Cape resident open lighthouse day in the spring. And we're just kind of working out the, the pieces of that, but that will continue. And the Sounds by the Sea obviously are very, very community based. So we're doing that. Any questions on community services? I have a simple little question, I think. Um, or maybe. Um, I guess it's a couple of things. Are there uh, programs that uh, people may be asking for that um, we just aren't able to fund or don't have the facilities to do them? Do you hear any like unmet Needs. wants out there? Um, at different times, there may be unmet needs with respect to programming, but it more is just trying to coordinate it in time to get it off the ground. Where there is an unmet need that we have been, um, that I oversee is the assistance or scholarship is what it's referred to as. I like to think of it as an assistance program. And we have a form that somebody has to fill out and they bring it to me. And it's, it's amazing to me how much it continues to be there, continues to grow. Um, I've been in charge of it for a multitude of years and it's this year I've given over $28,000 to people in the town of Cape Elizabeth to participate in our programs. The majority of them are youth, um, but we do have seniors and adults that need that help too and you want them to be able to use the pool or use the fitness center or, or you know, whatever it is they would like to do. So we, we work a lot on that. I'm very much in support of that. Do you have enough funding in order to support that? You feel that that adequate what you have? Yes, yes, I haven't felt that it pulls away from us at all. Long ago, um, when I first started, it was reimbursed. We would yeah. request it from the Jordan Trust, but um, that stopped. When we became part of the town, I think is when it kind of stopped. But the funding that we bring in covers the 28,000. Do you think there are more programs needed for seniors in town, or do you think that uh, they seem to we've, have We've gone through some ebbs and flows with the senior programming. I, we had a fantastic group of people that I love to travel with and take them on their trips. And a little bit before COVID, but more through COVID, they aged out or they went into different um, living environments that they weren't here in town anymore. Um, so we're working to bring that back. Jane has developed, we, we just developed a questionnaire that she's putting out to seniors to try and see what things they want to do. Um, you know, at one point it was, you know, just getting them out of the house to go to lunch, but maybe that's not what they want to do anymore. And so she's going to get a lot of feedback on that, hopefully, and we'll be able to find some other programs that we do. You know, you try, 
you see what other towns are doing and, and try to bring some of those things in. Sometimes you get obviously a discount by having a bigger group. So we combine with different rec departments to go different places and um, the, the bus still works great. And uh, I mean, I don't love driving it, but the bus works great. Um, and though, you know, it's, it's nice to be able to bring them places too. So hopefully. Good, thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Thank you, Kathy. You're welcome. Just wanted to say I'm I'm not going to the energy committee now, so you you staff that right? Are yeah. You the staff person for that? Thank you. Steve. Terrific. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, you're Steve. you're excused, David. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I guess Matt Matt would say we'd save the best for last, but then we would probably. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate the last. that. Yeah, there's more to come, right? <laughs> the biggest dollar amount. <laughs> oh, that's right. The biggest dollar amount. All right. So on, for Jay, we're starting on uh, page 90, 97? Yes, sir. Correct. 97. Yes, thank you, Chair Thompson. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, present the public works budgets uh, to you this evening. I usually uh, spend a few minutes just kind of doing a quick rundown on, on page 97 of uh, what our operational areas are that we cover. Uh, we maintain about 60 miles of roadway and everything within the uh, public right-of-ways. Uh, we maintain our town's stormwater um, system, which is, uh, equates to about 10 miles of underground pipe and about 1,300 storm drains. Uh, another part of the umbrella of public works is the um, recycling solid waste program at the recycling center. Uh, in addition, we have the parks and grounds maintenance, which takes care of uh, Riverside Cemetery, Fort Williams Park, Gullcrest, and all the town uh, facilities from the walls out. Within Public Works, we do fleet maintenance, so we take care of all of the other departments, uh, vehicles and equipment at Public Works. Additionally, our um, collector sewer system is maintained by Public Works. Uh, it is funded out of one of the special funds, the sewer fund, and there's about 26 miles of underground pipe and about 750 sewer manholes that's part of that system. We also operate and uh, manage Riverside Cemetery and also provide various support to other departments and uh, community groups. So that's a quick rundown of uh, what we do down there at Public Works. Um, I'll probably jump to the uh, individual pages, uh, which is um, for Public Works starts on page 106, and that has all the individual accounts um, that support uh, most of those services. Uh, so similar to other operating uh, departmental accounts, we have our um, personnel related expenses with payroll, um, part-time, full-time salaries and overtime, social security, workers' comp coverage. Um, one of the things I mentioned is uh, our stormwater program. So we're a, a, an urbanized community and we have a storm drain system that discharges to our uh, water bodies of the state, such as the Sperlink River and Casco Bay. So that, that qualifies us as being a regulated, what's called an MS4 community. And so we're regulated by the DEP to do uh, all sorts of um, good housekeeping and environmental stewardship. So I just, uh, every year I do a little one minute spiel on the stormwater program. And I have a fact sheet that um, every year I filter through Matt and sent to the town council. It, it gives an overview of that stormwater program. And that program is, is funded primarily through one of the accounts here called the MS4 program under Public Works, uh, along with many of the other um, accounts that also fall under Public Works, like storm drain maintenance and um, street sweeping operations and, and other uh, areas that we do. So um, some of the larger items uh, is obviously um, personnel and overtime. Vehicle maintenance uh, has continued to rise with um, cost of parts, parts cost of doing business for, for vehicle maintenance uh, with our fleet. So that's, that's um, one of the numbers that kind of jumps out there. Uh, we do some contractual snow plowing services uh, to maintain some of our facilities. So in addition to plowing our roads, we also take care of uh, our facilities and parking lots um, contractually. 
Let's see what else. Um, salt and sand for winter operations. Uh, you probably see those uh, budget numbers in your um, financial dashboard every month. So those are the big ticket items within public works. Most of the others are fairly um, supportive in nature with regards to operations, um, you know, office management and things of the like. Um, only a few things to note. Uh, there were a couple of adjustments that I wanted to point out on the payroll. I actually see from last year to this um, proposed 25 year, it actually went down a little bit. And we had, um, we had some turnover in the department, so we had some long-standing employees, you know, getting paid at a 15 or 20 year rate. Uh, and with new hires, it gives an opportunity to sort of reset um, the salaries uh, at new higher level, at new higher levels. Um, so it may look like an error there with it going down, but it's actually a reflection of a, a 3% COLA across the board um, townwide with those um, longevity adjustments with new hiring. Uh, the other one is overtime. So I dropped overtime about 11,000 from last year to this year. And I waited another year, I waited an extra year. I was gonna do this last year, but just looking at historical spending, we've never reached the, these overtime budgeted amounts. So um, I think the highest I've seen in the last five fiscal years is about 118. So um, that's the reason for that adjustment from down from 131. 40 to 120. So those were the notable um, decreases in this particular budget for public works. Everything else were um, fairly minor adjustments from account to account, just to um, account for contractual services and, and increasing costs, like I said, for parts and vehicle maintenance. Overall, that budget uh, went up by 0.45%, all said and done. And that is about, what's the dollar amount? Just about $7,000 from last year's, uh, from our current fiscal year 24 budget. I'll move ahead to um, refuse and recycling. Before you, I was oh, just unless you wanna uh, stop and oh, ask no, questions. Do you wanna go all the way through or? I can if that's okay with you. Is that okay with you? But if, if, yeah, if, I can wait. Okay. Um, refuse and recycling, the individual page um, for that is page 112. So these uh, costs are related to our recycling center, uh, all the uh, solid waste disposal, hauling, collection, um, recycling, uh, e-waste management. Uh, it also uh, funds our household annual household hazardous waste collection day in November. Uh, Again, similar to other, depart other um, accounts and departments with personnel um, being the driver of the majority of the costs. In this particular one, our eco-main fees um, is the significant piece of this budget. And um, this year, we actually had some um, changes to our what's called our tipping fees at eco-main. So for trash, we pay a certain fee to um, dispose of our trash um, per ton. And the same with recycling, uh, there's a certain rate. And every year, EcoMain does a, an assessment uh, for all the member communities uh, that Cape Elizabeth is one of. And uh, they, they reallocate the rates and distribute those to the municipalities. So we saw a fairly significant um, tipping fee uh, adjustments on both trash and recycling. And, and based on our tonnage, it works out to be about a $12,000 increase. Um, for both trash and recycling, so that's um, that was one of the one of the big adjustments um, within the recycling center. Um, really, the only other one of note that I could think of, I think uh, household hazardous waste. We've made some adjustments to that program uh, in November. Uh, last year was the first year that we we did not collect electronics and electronic waste at the HHW day. The reason being is uh, the contractor who sets this up and does the work uh, at our facility on that day was going to charge us uh, astronomical amounts of money to set up on a Saturday and have staff there. So um, we eliminated the electronic waste piece of the HHW day, and but we do allow collection um, year round at the recycling center for these materials anyways. And in addition, we have um, several weeks in the fall that we allow free drop off at the recycling center. Um, 
so we're kind of doing that electronic waste collection already um, in various ways at the recycling center. So we, we adjusted um, the household hazardous waste collection day down from 20,000 to 18. Overall, uh, went up about, it's about $30,000, 40,000. It equates to about a 5% increase overall in the recycling center budget. Um, the third sort of and last tree of public works is uh, parks and grounds. And the individual pages for that are on page 118. So as I mentioned um, earlier, we take care of all the, all the exterior grounds for, for the municipality, uh, which includes the fort, uh, the school campus, all the athletic fields, uh, Lions, Playstead, uh, parks, the uh, ball fields, Gullcrest, and Riverside Cemetery. Uh, so that's uh, the majority of these expenses within uh, the 102 5200, the parks and grounds uh, budget, are to uh, maintain um, all of our assets, uh, fields, and, and such. Items of note um, there was a, a line item in here called. Fort Williams Park building repairs, and it was at 29,000 annually. And what we've discovered is that Dave has been funding Fort Williams Park building repairs also, so in, in his facilities. So we've sort of had a, a double budgeting of sorts going on. Um, so that I decided to drop that down by 75% for this particular year. Um, we still do some internal. Um, building repairs separate from what Dave does, so I left a little bit in there, but that was a, a $21,000 drop um, from that account um, because Dave is already covering some of the other um, higher level expenses that, that come with the building repairs at the fort. Um, fencing and gate maintenance, it seems like every year we're spending so much money on fencing <laughs> and gates. So um, that one actually had to go up a little bit from 15,000 to 18,000. With um, contractual snow plowing services that we do, uh, both here at the municipal um, offices, we do um, contractually do uh, plowing, sanding and salting and, and clearing of walkways at the officer's row building at the fort. And that is done contractually. And so I've gotten revised pricing from our, um, our contracted uh, company that does that and they gave us about an 8% increase um, due to personnel costs on their end um, because a lot of it is uh, handwork and, and less machinery work when you're getting into steps, stairways and entryways. So that um, contracted snowplow services went up from 81,000 to 87,500. All in all, Budget went down by about $3,800, which was a 0.65% decrease, primarily due to that building uh, maintenance budgeting. So that's a quick rundown of uh, those three three budget areas. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Councilor McGregor, did you have some questions? Um, I did. I had a couple of questions, um, and I know. So um, thank you. Um, I, I'm. Uh, looking back at the public, the first part of the Public Works um, Department operating budget first, um, mm -hmm. I was just curious um, if we are using, and I know we've got additional time later in the evening to talk about um, maintenance or talk about um, imp capital improvement projects, but I, I was wondering if, if the department is using any type of a um, pavement maintenance software or package or anything of that sort to help us prioritize and, and where that is reflected in the budget. Sure. So we don't have an internal um, pavement management program, but what we do, and most municipalities, uh, some, uh, I should say, it's getting more into GIS and, and asset management um, electronically, but other municipalities like ourselves, um, every six to eight years we do a, a, a study and we hire a, an engineer um, to do a pavement condition analysis. So about every six years you could go back and find a report that actually um, does a full condition assessment of all our roadways, the entire network, uh, all 60 miles that we own, operate and maintain, 
and they use a uh, ASTM standard. It's a standardized method to um, rate the condition of the roadways. And um, they will identify uh, a ranking system. There's a zero to five ranking system or zero to 100 is di different rankings. But uh, they'll, they'll give each roadway uh, segment a condition um, ranking and they'll, they'll back it up with um, relative costs associated with uh, paving and um, also determine if there are other factors affecting the roadway like underground you know, drainage and, and other improvements that may be needed. And it'll also identify whether it can just be paved or it needs to be rehabilitated or if it needs to be completely reconstructed. So the different tiers of, of uh, improvements. So in the CIP, we, we actually, I think we're one fiscal year away from, from doing another pavement condition assessment which then supports the, the paving and drainage um, CIP. So I guess a couple of questions relative to that. Um, is it your recommendation that, that moving forward with that six year cycle as opposed to going to a sort of a more annual or, or <coughs> GIS type of you know, approach that can be updated annually, is that still the preferred option given where we are with the department size and, and budget? Yeah, I think staffing and resources play into it because then you have to you have to keep up with it. You have to update it annually. Um, you know, someone to do the assessment road by road. Um, you know, those types of things. And um, engineers will recommend that six to eight year window. Um, that even though six years seems like a long time, the the data is still valid through the course of that, and you can really use that through the course of six years. Um, to determine which roadways are, are next um, on the priority list for paving. So I think that works for now pretty, pretty well with us. Um, if we were to expand in the future, um, if we had a GIS coordinator, if we had you know, a, a more robust electronic uh, digital program, then we would certainly be interested in doing more of an electronic asset management system. And, and I guess, so the reason I, I wanted to ask about that now um, is similar to the question I had for um, David er, uh, earlier. You know, I, I was in a meeting not long ago with the uh, South Portland Public Works Director and what the, whatever program they're using is basically assigns a letter grade to their road, road con, roadway conditions. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't remember what the exact letter grade was, but it, it wasn't an A plus. And, um, and I just found that to be a very helpful communication tool in order for them, the South Portland Council, to be thinking about, well, what's the level of investment that's needed in order to maintain a rating relative to the standard benchmark? You know, do we want to be shooting for the A-plus or, you know, or should we be investing at this level and is that going to be able to keep us at whatever level of quality the council deems is appropriate? Um, and so I, um, thinking forward to next year's budget um, and the ability to get that type of information out of an updated pavement system, um, that, that's where I hope we would go. Um, and it looks like that's where you are thinking that might be able to take us to, or? I think we could, okay. we could head in that direction okay. at some point for certain. Okay. Absolutely. I had a, another question, but it was, um, related to the solid waste program. So I had a, before I do that, I wonder if anyone else had questions on the this portion. I, I just had a general question. Are you fully sa staffed at this point in time for public works? We have one parks, full-time parks right. position that is vacant. Okay. Otherwise. <clears throat> and we are looking for part-time summer folks. So if you need anybody or anybody that's like, would like to help out. We could use help on the part time part timers too. Okay, because I know that there had been some vacancies and so. Sure. Yes, we did. We did have um, three new hires last last year, um, which was great. And uh, so we still have one more one more to fill. Okay. Good. Plus the seasonals. Thanks. Thank you, Chair Thompson. Did we? I'm getting questions. I think there's a perception of the public because of the. The nature of the winter we've had with very few storms you know some of the homeowner associations saved money with having less plowing and all that did the town save a significant amount of money certainly have absolutely um, some of the accounts that are in public works 
over time is, is a major piece of, of winter um, vehicle maintenance can be uh, fuel and salt and sand and there's probably one or two others that I can think of um, that we're way under budget on. Certainly salt and overtime is, is way under at present. Would there be a kind of like a ballpark number you can think of? It doesn't have to be down to the dollar, but just a general. So for salt, we've spent 36% of the budget uh, as of March 1st, and we haven't used any since. So almost had to last night. Um, over time, one of the other larger ones that's driven by winter, we're at 51%, and this is 67% through the budget. So about 16% under. So, uh, fuel is a little harder to calculate. Um, it'd be better to do it at the end of the fiscal year to see where we are with fuel, but I, I know that's certainly another significant savings um, without the need to be plowing. It's, it's a major cost when it comes to winter. So I'd be happy to, to give, give more detail, kind of drill down into that a little more. Thank you. Yeah. You had a follow-up question. I, well, I did, and it's probably as much a comment as a question. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to, under the uh, municipal solid waste portion of the budget, mm -hmm. um, Thank you for noting the increase in the in the tonnage fee and including that into the, the budget and what some of the drivers around that are. Um, I just wanted to mention both for your benefit and, and for the benefit of other folks on the council that I just got here, I apologize for being a few minutes late, from the EcoMain board meeting. Um, and so I wanted to let folks know a couple things that pro won't affect this budget, but just thinking out to the 2026 budget. So. It is likely um, that the, I, I, I don't know that there's likely to be a significant increase again in the municipal solid waste portion of the budget, but it is likely that there is going to be another increase in the recycling tipping fees. Um, and in part, just so the council knows, that's due to a number of factors, but one of them is that EcoMain is trying to make sure that they're billing at cost for the tipping fees, the cost of, of associating the recycling. For a long time, EcoMain has subsidized recycling for member communities, but um, starting in 2026, communities will be eligible for reimbursement from the state under the extended producer responsibility for a portion of those re recycling fees. But if we are being subsidized by EcoMain, we're, we'd be eligible for less back from the state. So essentially, it's kind of a little convoluted, but essentially they're gonna charge us more so that we get more money back from the state, <laughs> um, if that makes sense. Um, and we should come out ahead in the end, but um, I just wanted to mention that so that folks know if we're seeing that a large increase in, in the recycling costs that there's some logic there. <laughs> Um, that um, is a little, anyway. But the other piece of that that uh, I, I'd like to do a little bit more digging on and it might be helpful to get started on with Christy in advance of that is that the town will also be eligible for reimbursement um, of um, recycling collection costs um, starting in the 2026 budget. And so to the extent we can you know, obviously we're not doing curbside, um, and I don't know that the collection costs that we have um, at the at the transfer station, how they break down and how they fit in under the rule, but to the, to the extent we can start breaking down or estimating the cost of running the recycling portion of the transfer station as opposed to the MSW portion of the transfer station, um, that may help line us up for additional reimbursement in the future. So that's something I just wanted to flag for the next budget year. Chris, actually I have a follow-up question for Councilor Gabrielson. So the, I think some, I hear in the public the confusion, the skepticism about what really happens with the recycling, and is it worth it and all that, but is, is it fair to say that the, you know, the more the citizens recycle, the better for our budget? 
Yes. Well, so currently, the tipping fee that we're paying on recycling is significantly less than the MSW tipping fee. So the more tonnage we put in there, the, the less money we're spending on solid waste overall. But um, when the extended producer responsibility comes into effect, that math is going to become even more dramatically in favor of recycling because we'll be able to recoup a lot of the costs associated with recycling from uh, from the state, well, from the producers. Okay. I mean, if I could just add two yeah. things to each each comment, actually, um, the more you recycle, the less costly it is for the taxpayers. Yeah. It's it's finan it makes good financial sense too, um, and in particular, we are going to be spending. $97.50 per ton for trash and $65 per ton for recycling. So it's pretty significant difference um, between trash and recycling. And then on the, the EPR, um, I've been following the legislation and, and have gone to some of the stakeholder uh, meetings as well. So uh, I know it's a council goal that was added and the recycling committee's uh, on board for monitoring that. So as I understand from what I'm hearing with the draft legislation is that um, collection costs, even at recycling centers or transfer stations, are eligible costs. So we'll be um, we'll be poised to start getting a revenue stream from this EPR program. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So we can always do better, but as a town, we do pretty well, though, don't we? Uh, don't we? I, I, I remember. I haven't seen something recently, but it seems like we. I remember stories where Cape would be ranked pretty well as far as what the citizens do from a recycling standpoint. But they are. Yeah. yeah. We recycle about 27, 28%. Um, and when you look at all the rest of the communities in Eco Maine, we're about ninth place, if you will, um, when you look at other recycling rates. So yeah. and there's about 30, 30 members or so that they list out. Uh, I'd be happy to share that with you. We, we get monthly reports on that from Eco Maine. Well, now that we have Councillor Gabrielson on the Board, we could work on improving that, but okay. Um, yes, Tim. Just to, this is not a question, a comment. I'm sure it's shared by everybody, but I have never lived in a community in which I actually look forward to going <laughs> to a dump, a transfer station. The employees and uh, you know all, all aspects, and of course the swap shop are are fun to deal with, talk to, and joke with. I mean, I. So anyway, thank you. I just want to make that thank acknowledgement. You. I'll pass that along. I go to the recycling center, and I have one or more of my grandchildren. We, I can't get in and out of there without going to the swap shop. <laughs> can't drive by it. <laughs> Can I have a question for Matt? Um, and, and actually, Jay, I'm glad you highlighted, because I have a little asterisk next to this uh, building at Fort Williams that mm -hmm. uh, Public Works was had in their budget. One of the questions I have is, and I, I know that um, we may have done this in the past or I asked for it in the past. Can we have all Fort Williams put in one place? I mean, I, I understand having it across these budgets, but can we at the very end somewhere have all of the expenses that are related to Fort Williams, as well as the revenues, as well as uh, everything else. So we get to see the full picture. It's, I kind of put it together as we go through. And I know citizens have asked for this in the past as well. Uh, yeah, uh, Councilor George, I know Christy and I have been working on that. We were speaking about it again this afternoon, so uh, she's close to the finish line on that as well. Why is she always one step ahead of me now? She's two steps I'm ahead so of me. I'm so glad you hired her. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep, that's right, in, in, in she's motion. One step I, I agree with uh, Council Jordan. I think there's a lot of conversation going on. You know, probably some of it's come out of our school building activity that there's a perception that the fort could be a source of more and more revenue and, you know, as you look at all the different pieces, I, I'm not sure that you could make a very good argument that the fort's paying for itself yet, uh, with, especially with all the millions of dollars that you, your comprehensive plan over there is a very good comprehensive plan. I think it was only 2021, wasn't it, that the Fort Williams comprehensive plan was completed? And, and so I, I think there's quite a few identified um, 
repairs and fixes that need to be made, but it would, it would help us, I think, uh, to get a clear picture that, that uh, there's some opportunities, and I think that, that you're, you're, the Fort Williams uh, uh, committee has already voted to increase parking and things like that, but um, to get our arms around the, the, the real numbers on whether or not there is this great pool of revenue that could be uh, uh, available for, for other sources, uh, th that, would, that would help a lot, I think. So I think it's a good idea. All right, so uh, any, any other questions on this portion? So we would next go to uh, our finance director. And we can find uh, her work on page 161. Good evening, thank you. Um, I'm here to present the debt service for the town portion only. Um, the numbers I'm going to give you do not include the school and they do not include the sewer because they are not part of the tax rate at this time. So I just wanted to make that clear. Um, the total debt service budget is about $1.255 million. That encompasses both the bond and interest principal and any capital lease payments. Um, principal bond payments for the upcoming fiscal year are anticipated to be $693,772. Um, and that is made up of all the town's bonds with an additional $180,000 in principal that we have put in for CIP. I can talk about it more when we get into the CIP projects, but there is a funding through Maine Municipal Bond Bank that we can get a very low rate that um, Jay and Kathy and I and Matt have all discussed. Um, so there is an, an extra $180,000 for financing for CIP in there. The interest payable is $121,536. And your total lease payments that includes interest. It's the accounting world's way of saying, we're gonna confuse you. So um, the 44109 is principal and interest. Debt service, um, just to give you some background as a percentage of expenditures for the town of Cape Elizabeth is below 8%. It's around 3.64%, which is very good for the town, which means we have a low debt ratio. Um, the overall net debt per capita is below $1,000. It's around 978, which is also considered low. And the reason I wanted to highlight those two particular points is those will affect the bond rating. So that is a very good point for any financing that the town wants to, wants to do. We look at um, those ratios, the bond rating agencies look at the ratios and with that service, there's not a lot of uh, wiggle room. Your principal payments are what they are, and you pay them. But I'm happy to answer any or all questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Capital planning on 194. Okay. So our next, our next, uh, <coughs> We'll get into capital planning, and we, that begins on page 194. And uh, I'll get us started on this, Mr. Chairman. Okay, go ahead. Thank so you. Uh, what you'll notice throughout this capital segment here, <clears throat> excuse me, from, uh, from my initial budget to where we are today, this segment has grown significantly over the years because we've tried to include a higher level of detail uh, across the board for all of our different departments. Uh, we did, as David uh, Bagdasarian talked about earlier, uh, about the schedule for uh, facilities, uh, capital investments. You'll notice that those are on page 197, uh, and that is a, a collection of all of the different facilities needs that we have, as well as uh, some work that is done with Christy as far as our, our public works uh, items as well. So we've tried to bring as much as we can into this to give you an overall picture. Uh, the larger report and specific details on the on different buildings, Dave has that, and we'll be bringing that forward as well eventually. Uh, but we're, what we're trying to look at is the, is your capital 10-year plan so folks can know and plan for accordingly going forward. 
the highlights of this year's items that we have this year are, uh, you know, or some changes that we've noticed. This year is not a heavy capital year, uh, just due to some, you know, in comparison, I guess, to the past few years where we've had to replace, you know, uh, a couple of different fire apparatus, rescues, plow trucks, uh, other large items, large, uh, large rolling stock that we've had to replace. This year we're, we're lighter on that than we have been uh, recently. Uh, police Department also has uh, just uh, one cruiser this year. So this is one of the off years where they have one cruiser versus the two. So last year we replaced two. Uh, this year there are, there's one uh, that is in there uh, that we have identified. And then as far, and we additionally uh, offsetting some of our capital needs this year, our grant funding. Uh, so we have uh, for the town center intersection work, uh, as the council remembers from last week, uh, going through the presentation that we had on town center improvements, uh, the lion's share of that is provided by grant funding through PACs, as well as TIF funding from the town center, uh, town center TIF that have no impact at all on the tax rate going forward or on the overall expenditures. Uh, we'll also have uh, the Sawyer Road, uh, three-year project that exists there. Uh, the town, we have $75,000 in this year, but that's helping us leverage uh, over the next three years, one point, just under $1.6 million. So that's, that also helps our capital bottom line. And then uh, we do have a couple of different larger ticket items that we have uh, in, in this year's, or three of them really. Uh, so we have Casino Beach Stormwater Management, uh, project that is uh, our larger ticket item on the on the infrastructure side uh, work on battery blare which is necessary to maintain that it's also it's going to uh, help maintain that for the long haul that's about a 25 year uh, life project and then uh, also work on uh, as you recall from last year one of the items pushed forward into the this coming fiscal year is work on the playground and relocating the playground from where it is currently over to by the ch children's garden. So we have, have those, uh, those are three of our larger ticket items and as well as uh, work at the, the parade grounds or the, uh, the bleachers at, at where the graduation ceremonies are held at, at the fort. So uh, offsetting some of those improvements we have, uh, we're looking to do as Christy had, uh, had mentioned, uh, a bond through Maine Municipal Bond Bank. Uh, so instead of putting the larger expense all at once on here, especially on long-lived items, such as uh, the infrastructure improvements at Casino Beach and Battery Blair, uh, those are, we decided to be more fiscally prudent to put those together in a, in a bond uh, to go forward for the next, on a five year. So instead of having uh, roughly $850,000 to $875,000 come online, uh, looking at, at breaking that out over a five-year period at about roughly $185,000 uh, on that for the annual debt service to that to that bond. And then also offsetting that, we're using $500,000 worth of um, unassigned fund balance to help fund that part of it. And then also uh, in other portions of the budget, $300,000 worth of carry forwards that will, will apply as well. So we're trying to let some of our savings from the past help pay for the future needs, but at the same time, uh, we're trying to plan us for the long term. So uh, that's the general overall picture of what we're trying to accomplish through the capital side. Um, can we, in the future, um, because underneath the uh, public works, there's a whole list of stuff, and some of them can get grouped under equipment, others can get grouped under uh, you know, road or whatever, blah, blah, blah. I mean, Jay can probably come up with a better word. But if we can group them, then we can see quickly, okay, we're going for equipment, and these are the pieces that are needed in order to. There's always a rotary mower, I swear <laughs> to God. Um, but that way we can quickly see um, um, what, what's needed for equipment and equipment replacement what's needed for roads and what's needed for other, you know, sundry kind of things. So that would be my request to group them. And I would do that under any category, um, like uh, under the town hall, um, we've got um, 
Town Hall, we've got Green Belt Trail Improvements. So is the Green Belt going to now come through the Town Hall or? Uh, oh, it's behind the Town Hall. So somehow you've got to put like things together or um, uh, people aren't going to easily be able to assimilate what's going on here. That's, that's great. We can, you know, we can work on classifying them by type and uh, assets. Yeah, something you know. along those lines. Sure. Yeah. And then, uh, or if, if we may, Mr. Chairman, the, yeah, the one area that we have, actually, that's later in the CIP, but the green belt is, uh, was a request from, uh, from the Conservation Committee for green belt maintenance, which is, the, I think it's the last page, actually, of your, of this whole section uh, that we have here. But uh, you may, Council may recall that last week you received an email from one of the members of the Conservation Committee uh, asking for, uh, asking for the town to fund it at $40,000, and I think that, uh, I, I spoke with Maureen shortly thereafter. I said, we let's, let's put that in there at $40,000 and let the member know that, uh, that and, but they had both misread uh, what we had. So yeah, I get a little feedback there, I noticed. But that's, but that's one of the areas that we have there for, for, for investment. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Because it, it goes through all the projects. Of the, uh, of the larger? Yeah, I've been following on this. Oh. Yeah. Oh, My apologies, okay. Mr. Chair. Um, I emailed when I looked in the, in the back of your CIP and it said construction services. I didn't like it. So when I emailed you all the other day, um, I added an account description so you could actually see what the project is because I said, well, that looks funny to me. So I just wanted to clarify that that did come through the email. I apologize uh, for the lateness, but I wanted to break it out for everyone to be able to see. Yeah, this is very helpful. Yes, I just wanted to ask about a couple of projects that we've heard a little bit about, um, and um, I guess the ones that I'm thinking of are all roadway projects. Um, one first is the um, seawall down by Kettle Cove, um, and just wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about that project and what is happening in the near term. Sure. I guess the other related one is the shore road over topping. And, yeah. Sure. Um, so relating to January 10th and 13th uh, storm damages, um, those were the two primary areas where we, we um, sustained a lot of damage, as you know. And um, with regards to Kettle Cove, we've been working on repairing the boat launch um, because it will start turning into the season where people want to start gaining access to the water. So we've actually made some strides in repairing that. Um, the next phase at Kettle Cove is to repair the, the edge of the roadway and the sidewalk that washed out. So currently we were able to, back in January, able to just restore the roadway and, and then the sidewalk got hit on the second storm. So we have an estimate um, from a contractor that I've got to get together with Matt to see if um, we have any any existing funds in our, our CIP to help um, restore that area. Um, we also received notice today relating to both Shore Road and Kettle Cove that both the storms were combined into one and um, the federal government has declared it a, a disaster. So that means that it's eligible for um, FEMA funding. So in, in both locations, um, they're actually both listed in our emergency management plan with our Cumberland County uh, agency, EMA. And um, because they're listed as vulnerable areas that we've identified, that they actually are eligible for additional funding beyond the storm damage called hazard mitigation. So there are hazard mitigation grants that go towards um, these identified areas. So I think after the dust settles, when we get through reimbursement of existing operating costs and other things um, is that we're going to we're going to start going after those hazard mitigation funds and, and so those hazard mitigation funds would allow us to build back 
better than what was there before? Yes, okay. yes. So currently how FEMA works is they will only reimburse us for what was there and they will not um, give you any additional money to make things better or improve the, you know, structure of the roadway or armoring or anything like that. So that's where the hazard mitigation funds come in is to, is to do something above and beyond what was there previously. And, and, and if I may, if yeah. I may, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, above and beyond that, Kettle Cove specifically is we need, we're in the process of establishing a dialogue with the state because I think between both of us, our combined efforts, I, I want to see if there's a way that we can leverage those funds or even a greater level of funds because uh, looking at this, the, the, the seawall or the breakwater down there and the, where that may be. And if we have both of us working in concert, I think we can, we may be able to leverage even greater. Uh, greater option. Thank you. Um, and then the other question I had a pro uh, other project I had a question about um, is the engineering design work that's in line for this year for the Mitchell Road culvert. Yes. And I um, just wanted, I'm curious because I know uh, both as someone who recreates and drives on Mitchell Road that there's been a lot of additional uh, use of that roadway by both pedestrians and bicyclists over the last five years and that culvert is a little bit of a pinch point now and so I'm just curious as part of the design work if there is any um, opportunity or intention to look at how we could better accommodate pedestrian and bicycle use within that right of way there. Sure. Uh, wasn't part of the original scope, but that's certainly something we can add to that. Um, I know there's guardrail and it does tighten up there, so there is sort of a, a squeeze point um, for other users. So w with the Culver project, we'll have to open that whole area up and that would be the time to reset the guardrail back or maybe um, create a, a walking path along the side of the roadway to get through there safer. Great. So we could certainly add that. Councilor Reiniger, did you have a question? Yeah, I, a matter that's been brought to our attention, I think it's on Two Lights Road in Hannaford Cove. It seems like it's been kind of a vexing issue for a while. I've had a sense from some that maybe it could be a very expensive issue. And I don't know if that's something that's not large enough to warrant being in, mentioned anywhere, or if there's a, just curious what the status of that situation. Sure. So, um, so over the winter we've put together a, a design um, to install an underdrain system at the intersection of Hannaford Cove Road and, and Two Lights Road. And the issue is groundwater. It's, it's, um, it's coming up from, from the ledge uh, up to the surface of the roadway. And in the winter time with the winters we're having, we're having water running and then freezing overnight and sheeting across the roadway. So our plan is to um, do that in the spring um, without any need for CIP funds. It would be a project we would do um, in-house with our, with our public works crews uh, to get that water off the roadway and, and down around the corner, down the street. So it's, it's, uh, it's my hope that that's a, a non-issue after this June. Great, thank you. And then one other question. I may have missed it, but I, I see a reference here to an addition to the town hall. Is there going to be more discussion about that or more details? I'm just curious. Uh, if, if I can. Sure. Yeah. yeah. At this point, it's, it's kind of like, uh, I hate to say because the term has been used too much lately in the news, but a concept draft. Uh, but we're looking at uh, the, a big challenge that we have here with this and looking at the Harriman report that we had was there was a number of different repairs and replacements of assets of the town, the heating system, uh, HV, you know, basically HVAC, uh, space needs, uh, routine maintenance or long, longer life the repairs that have to take place, as well as uh, well, you spend enough time in this building that you've seen a lot of the challenges that we've we've faced, uh, technological upgrades as well to be able to, because there's a higher level of demand for this, for use of the spaces within the town hall as well for meetings and uh, televising those meetings or finding a way to get them out there and gain access. So uh, the larger issue comes into, you know, anytime you want to hire someone, and, and then additionally, anytime you want to hire somebody new, uh, the first question that comes to mind is, where are they going to sit? Where are they going to work? Uh, you know, recently when we added Jake, uh, our assistant code officer, uh, we ended up 
the, as you saw in the ACP office, we took the, uh, what used to be Ben's office, took that and converted that into a smaller conference room and moved Jake and Ben into what used to be the larger ACP conference room. Uh, and then uh, when Angela Frawley was talking the other night about uh, in the clerk's office, now we've got what before we had, uh, before we had Melissa on board, we had two people in that office. Now we have three people in that office. So we're trying to find a place to put folks. It, it's, you start to look at that, okay, we've got some, we have some challenges. So with an aging building, uh, this is a great building. And this, you know, it's one of the one of the pride and joy moments of the of the town is to have this in the town center, and it's the town hall. But it needs it needs it needs some TLC and the conversation about potential expansion. And so, uh, looking at that, uh, I put in funds this year to try to look at getting some planning and engineering to say, okay. Could we go out, hire an architect and someone to look at the systems and say, you know, we've got a good feel from the Harriman report about how the systems are. How could you flex that on this building and, and expand it, expand the town, you know, council chambers, perhaps more, more meeting space, uh, upgrades to the, the CETV studio, uh, additional office space for folks online uh, who may want to come. Uh, come to work for the work for the town, or, or as you need more staffing needs going forward in the future, how are you going to house them? As well as uh, as Dave was talking about earlier, the boiler and the challenges we have on the HVAC side of it. How would you how would you fix that? Because it is not the most efficient, but uh, just trying to retrofit something in may not be the best approach either. So uh, that's why we put in 60,000 this year in the budget to say, okay, let's take a look at that so we can set a long-term plan for, uh, to inform the council, we could do this uh, in the future. And then uh, this could be, you know, possible alternatives for expansion as well as renovations. Uh, the other thought that comes to mind is uh, the, within this past legislative or last year's legislative session, there was a change in, uh, in how TIF funds can be used. And the town has, has a town center TIF that exists that provides funds based on all the growth. You know, part of it this year we're using to fund the town center intersection improvements. Well, the change that they made is that you can fund improvements to town facilities or town buildings, specifically a town hall. So if you could find a way to figure out what it would cost to you know, to do upgrades to the town hall, do a renovation and an expansion, not blow it up. We've got space to the back that we could do, a, I think, a conservative but useful expansion. <clears throat> and then let the growth that takes place in the town center pay that debt service. Then you could do something like that and not have a significant impact on the taxpayers or let the investments that may flow in the town center that's generating for the next 20 or so years pay a smaller smaller bond that you might have. Now, anything that's gonna be over a million dollars, <throat> excuse me, it's gonna be related to, you know, it's not like there'll be multiple projects. There would be a one, it would be one project. That would still have to go to the voters for approval as, as part of the charter. But uh, that's kind of the, the, the about a three year plan to, to try to get to that point. Yeah, going, tied to this, but going beyond, I'll just comment that I've, I've lived in another community that bit the bullet and just did a major renovation of the, uh, the town building and, it, and had a major citizen effort in fundraising for private, you know, the, you know the, the leading families of the community led the fundraising effort and they just decided after all the analysis, you know, you know it, for all kinds of needs to go in and just do a complete blowout and and you know restore and have a beautiful town meeting space with modern acoustics and everything versus you know I you know it's a tough decision you know, at what point do you go for the big change or just keep making uh, more modest changes no, it's, it's it's a great if, if I may, Mr. Chairman, I know I, I've, I've lived through that once before in a prior life. Uh, when I was uh, on the council in Gray, we had our Stimson Hall, which is this white elephant we have in the center of town, which is, luckily we sold it, because it was it's still a white elephant in the center of town. Uh, and then we had the town office was in an, uh, what was a previous post office, uh, you know, tw basically a 24 by 40 ranch building. 
and the school got done with what uh, was Pennell, was a junior high when my sister went there forever and a day ago. And they had, they said, well, we're not gonna use this building anymore, it's yours. So we ended up going to the state and then taking it over and we spent a million and a half uh, and redid that and that became what is now the town of Gray town office. I know uh, Councillor Thompson and Councillor Jordan and I have spent a lot, a lot of, at least the past couple of weeks discussing uh, the 1930s building over on the school campus and where that sits in the relationship of the larger project of the school question. So that's, you know, that's one of those areas too. So um, that's, that's in the hypothetical set right now. And this is, and, and this is more in the, has its feet on the ground, uh, at least with the current town hall. Uh, but at least I think it's worthwhile to take a look at what the, what this lady needs uh, for work to to set it up for the long for the long haul. I could follow up. So for the 1930 building, are you thinking the old gym could be a big meeting hall? Interesting. That's great. But no uh, immediate plan to building next next week. So <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> that one's a TV uh, T. The, the still with the 30s building. So that's, uh, we try not to get too distracted <laughs> with that conversation as we try to look at the larger picture. But, uh, but for this, uh, the staff actually approached me uh, about a year and a half ago and said, you know, we really need to do something about this. And last year being what it was, uh, I felt, you know, with the school project being uh, in line and that's the larger question. Uh, at least if we can do the planning and engineering, we'll know once you get the larger question really done, that's affecting, that's facing the community now. But having that uh, flexibility with the change in the legislation to allow the use of TIF funds could be a game changer for any decision that's made relating to town offices and, and renovations and expansions that need to take place. So, uh, that, but I think it's a, be a great opportunity to use those funds to, to set you up long-term. All right, um, I don't think we have any further questions on that piece. Let's, so what, what page would we go to then? Do you wanna to go to uh, special funds on page 164? Okay, yes. Uh, these, these are the funds. So oops, now we'll go to page 164. <laughs> and then uh, if, if I may, Mr. Chairman, just to sure. help as an introduction. Uh, so these are uh, you know, affectionately called the special funds for a reason. Uh, they're all for different special uses that the town has over the years. So you've got, uh, so in succession, we have the sewer fund, which Jay will talk about and, uh, and how that is. That's, that's the funding that we use to, to take care of that segment of the infrastructure that's supported by uh, sewer revenues. And then you have Portland Headlight, which Kathy will speak about, uh, Kathy Raffis will speak about regarding the headlight, the gift shop, the revenues from that, expenditures that are related to the care and maintenance of Portland Headlight. Uh, also, uh, then we'll switch over to myself briefly for the Thomas Jordan Trust, and then back to Jay for the Riverside Cemetery and the, and, and the revenues related to that, and then back to Kathy on Fort Williams Park Capital Fund, and then, uh, and then finally to myself for the, for the TIF Fund. But they're pretty, they're all pretty straightforward. These are mostly almost like enterprise funds where they, you know, they generate a revenue and they help off, off, offset expenses. Okay, you guys, I'd be happy to take a uh, sewer fund if you're ready. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Thank so, you. and that's on page 170. Yes, thank you. So uh, as Matt mentioned, the special fund, sewer fund, um, is, to, is to manage our operations with regards to our wastewater system. Um, the primary um, driver of this account is the Portland Water District Assessment, which is one of the um, specific accounts within the uh, 0040 sewer fund. So we work with the Portland Water District um, who uh, manages our billing, our sewer billing. They also operate our wastewater treatment plant on the Southern Cape uh, section of our wastewater system and all the uh, wastewater pump stations throughout town. Um, so the majority of this fund, um, probably about 75% of it goes 
to the water district um, for their operations um, to serve our sewer system. So um, that's, that's the big piece of, of this particular fund. Um, there is a, uh, another large account called maintenance contracts, so that's where um, what the town uses. Uh, if we have uh, issues with our um, local sewer system that we maintain, uh, the smaller lines in the residential areas, uh, that's what that is used for. And then any unused um, funds from the sewer fund go into a uh, reserve account at the end of each fiscal year. Um, so that's sort of the, the financial structure of, of the sewer account. Uh, the, the big thing to note with, with sewer fund is um, two years ago, the town council approved a three a three year, 3% 3 increase year over year in the sewer rates. Um, so FY25 is year three uh, of those adjustments. So um, do have a rate increase um, proposed. This is the, the last of the three um, year over year increases uh, this coming year. So um, that's about it. Um, in a nutshell, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. I'm just curious with regard to the rate increase. My, my recollection, and I'm going back, is that that was to help bring us closer in, or in line with costs. Um, after FY25, when do we need to think about rate increases again? Is that, do you have a sense of how close to in, you know, does that, does that bring us where we wanna be for FY25, but then we need to start thinking about it again in 20, excuse me, 26? It does, it's sort of a revolving thing. Um, we meet with the Portland Water District annually in say October or November. Uh, Matt and I meet with their representation and because this account is, is such driven by their costs, um, you know, year over year, we sort of have to reassess uh, whether our fees are keeping up with their expenses. Um, so that's sort of the exercise we have to do on an annual basis. So this particular year, they, they came in with a relatively um, small uh, rate increase to us for this Portland Water District assessment. So I think we're, we're gonna be in good shape for this year and next year, but it, I don't think it'll be long. We, we sort of need to keep pace with, with their costs um, and keep an eye on that as we go. Portland Headlight, uh, the major driver here is the gift shop and the museum, um, the revenue drivers there. Uh, the gift shop is, we have um, some staff down there that is a paid staff with um, the on part-time basis. And then we have many, many volunteers that cover the hours at the lighthouse. We are open seven days a week, six hours a day um, from Memorial Day weekend until it used to be um, indigenous weekend, uh, the holiday, we've tried to extend it a couple times. There's not, we start to run out of um, merchandise. So this year we're purchasing more merchandise. We hope to go to the end of October. Um, by that time, there's less and less visitors to the park. Cruise ships, are, there's only one more in November, the first weekend in November, or the first week in November. So I think we um, will hit as much as we can hit. I know people think that it should be open more hours. Um, to get volunteers to cover all those hours is an astronomical feat, and we work in conjunction with each other at the, at the fort to get people in at the, near the end of the season, because a lot of your volunteers tend to be older folks who go away in the winter. So we um, start losing our, our, our volunteers as that time goes on. So the headlight counts very much on those gift shop sales. We've had a lot of museum tours, um, a lot of group ones that people have asked to do with school departments and whatnot, um, and we coordinate with that. We don't necessarily charge the school department to come in, but we want them to come and see this, the site, and so we open at different times for those people, so we work with them. The, in the submission that you saw, um, one of the things we want to do is upgrade our software system, and I think we talked about this last time. 
it has come to that point. We've been in discussion with our software company. At the headlight, you do a credit card transaction separate from the actual purchase transaction, so it seems like it shouldn't be a big deal, but every function is a two-time function if they're using a credit card, and credit cards are much more highly used now. So we are working to get that into our software system as one function. Um, but in doing so, we have to upgrade our terminals, as well, our hardware as well. So we're going to be upgrading the hardware, upgrading the software, and technology is committing to making sure that happens before we go open on Memorial Day weekend. Uh, damages at the Lighthouse, um, another expense that's obviously happened. The hardscaping outside has been damaged a couple times through the heavy waves and storm damage. Some of that will potentially come back to us, but I allocated some funds in there because the last storm, we really need to look at what we're going to do with that going forward. That hardscaping with the large stones was done um, a, a few years back when they redid the whole thing. It's not going to last. It's not staying with the, with the um, heavy waves that we're having now up there, so we're going to have to take a look at that. So I have some funding allocated aside for that, and we're working with Nick Tamaro, who had done the previous works there to see if there's something we can do. We purchased all of those big stones through the use of the work. It's now a matter of what we're going to do to keep those. Um, additionally, there's the fencing around the lighthouse that needs some work. It was damaged in the storm as well, so that's, that's part of it as well. Thankfully, we put the storm windows up over the museum itself this year. So there was, you know, the um, facilities department came through and put those up and that protected the property inside, which was nice. The last thing, the only door, the only thing that was damaged was the door entering the tower. It was knocked in. Public Works came and covered it up and that's a cement floor and there's nothing really in there for it to damage, so that was not major. Um, I know David's going forward to replace the windows in the next year as well. So as soon as our our season is over, hopefully they'll start to do that. So that's where Portland Headlight is. And, and a good update on that, on the light, on the windows as well. David went out, uh, that was, as you may recall, a pretty major project and uh, we, we uh, had sustained substantial damage last year. Uh, but to just replace the windows is not something you just can do. So what, uh, so heavy work, Dave worked with the historical Society of the State of Maine and got the design approved, found a perfect architect to do the work for us. And part of the claim that we had from last year, uh, plus the funds that we had set aside for this year, uh, this year's budget, uh, meets the cost. So we've gone out to bid, came back with a great, uh, a great price that came back, uh, met all of the, the architectural uh, specifics. And so, uh, so we're looking to have that done. Uh, Dave had a couple of different sections there. I think it was before before the start of May or in October. So I think they're going to go towards October. One of the other items that we found, uh, there was some thought that, that they were, wanted to add storm windows to it, but our experience over the past two winters has shown that uh, the board system that has, you know, necessity being the mother of invention, uh, the board system that we put up is actually going to provide us greater protection going forward in the years to come. So. Uh, aesthetically, they look fine, and, and it's going to protect those windows. So we're trying to protect the investment as it as it goes back in to, to get there. So uh, hopefully it'll keep us protected for years to come, as we've seen some pretty substantial storms that have hit, you know, and the wave action has been brutal. They, they make for spectacular pictures. Oh, my gosh, yeah. <laughs> those waves, but <laughs> Unfortunately. they're not good for our buildings. Um, no. I have a question. Yes. Um, Number one, I think online sales is a fabulous idea. I think that will be a real home run. Um, so great idea and with new technology, hopefully we can do that. Um, and this might be a Matt question and you may have answered it already, but I probably was uh, playing, That's okay. <laughs> playing games over here with, anyway. Um, on page 174, can you explain those last two items to me, the transfer to general fund and the use of surplus on is it 174? Mm -hmm. I can't figure. 
Christy, I think you could, you, Christy can explain this better than I can. Yes. Can you take the tough questions? I can, I can, Good. Penny, I can for you. Um, the transfer into the general fund is basically if we need the money, that's a placeholder because the fund is doing so well. Mm -hmm. um, the use of surplus is saying, hey, we have money, we're going to reinvest money in the fund. Okay, so is this saying that there was um, available dollars, yes. at revenue, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the fort, which was then transferred into the general fund for if use. needed, yes, and that the uh, use of surplus is saying that revenue that has been generated is going to be used within this entity. Correct. That's what I thought. Thank you. You're welcome. Did that make sense to everybody? All right. Any other questions on? All right, so the next would be Thomas Jordan Trust, Mr. Chair. Tom, okay, let's. No, is that you? That'll be me. Okay. Yep. As uh, as counselors, Jordan uh, Harriman. Uh, page one seventy seven. Yeah. Yeah. And counselor Gillis, all know we've uh, the the Thomas Jordan Trust is a fund that exists out there for the uh, and it's established. Uh, for the assistance of uh, folks who uh, who need assistance within the assistance within the community, but may fall out of the normal uh, guidelines of assistance, and uh, this has been a fund that's helped a lot of people in a lot of different uh, situations over the years. And uh, what this here is is a uh, it's just the funding that that will go into it. Uh, we do do a transfer into the general fund uh, to help offset the uses of those funds, but we also place some of that those funds into investment and uh, also assist with us uh, on the general assistance side of it. So those funds are, that's pretty much been the same as what we put in annually for a number of years. But the fund itself, uh, the trust fund itself is, it has done very well over the, you know, over the past eight to 10 plus years uh, as far as growth within the market because that's the majority of their assets have been, have been market driven. Yes. Just really quick question for the benefit of the public. Did this fund start during the depression? No, okay. this fund, uh, if, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Uh, when uh, the, the town um, received what was the poor farm and years ago across from where, you know, basically the, the very large area of land across the, the street from where the recycling center is and the public works building are, uh, but originally, in, it, it housed the poor farm where folks could go there and, and, and live and, and, and get back on their feet. Uh, what they found is that over time, you know, that didn't function in that way anymore. So in order to, uh, and basically you were outside of what the, the, the realm of the trust had required, uh, that is initially established that piece of land. So the town had to make it whole by then taking funds and putting that into an account in order to use it for this way to help folks because having a poor farm today doesn't work the same as it did back in 1900 and uh, you know back you know 100 and plus years ago so um, so those funds you know the town had to fund that and put that into an account and then that has grown over the years to then provide to serve that function instead and that at the same time that land itself had a long-term easement put on it to stop it from being developed. So uh, kind of that's for the benefit of the overall community to enjoy at the same time, the funds that are there for the overall community to enjoy in, in times of need. Thank you, I just, I've never seen anything like this. I think it's very special. It's wonderful arrangements. So I was just curious how far back this goes. Is it, uh, you know, in terms of. Oh gosh, quite, quite a long time. Uh, I'd say, I can't say specifically, but probably over 100 years. The what? The, the, that as an asset for the town, it must be into, into 100 years at this point now. Oh, easy. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yep. Great. Yeah. Couple hundred. And I think that the trust itself goes back to the 80s. I think the late 80s, early 90s is when that they, they, they came to that agreement with the state the AG's office and, and established that trust then. All right, 
any other questions on that? Okay, so the next one, you, will you do the, the Riverside as well? That'll be Mr. Reynolds. Oh, oh, oh sorry. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And that is on page, that's on page 177. Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you. All right, so uh, Riverside Cemetery, similar to the sewer fund, um, sort of operates like an enterprise account uh, with revenues and expenses. And Riverside also has a, a specific CIP associated with it. Uh, what's on page uh, 179 is the, um, the outline, uh, the table with the uh, individual budget accounts. Uh, so those are the expenses associated with Riverside. And um, as I mentioned, Public Works um, operates and main, maintains and manages that facility. And um, these costs are associated with this specific Riverside um, operations, uh, payroll, uh, our part-time salaries is for um, the majority of our grounds maintenance crews. Um, that's mostly our um, weekly operations other than funeral services as well. Um, so that's uh, what the overtime is for. Um, fairly um, small account. It is a very small increase of only $2,000 year over year. Um, so not much change on the expenses side. I wanted to um, take the opportunity tonight to talk about um, two other related things to Riverside though. Um, I met with Deb Lane and Deb helps out with Riverside as well. Um, she is involved with the, uh, more of the lot sales and uh, some of the other fees associated with it. And um, she's been tracking um, lot sales and availability of lots. Um, so, and we also discussed fees briefly. And uh, we did note that um, the lot sales, the fees for lot sales um, were last updated in 2012, and the uh, burial fees um, for Riverside were last updated in 2015. So, you know, we're nine and 12 years out on a, on a potential um, fee update. So it might be something um, if the council or finance committee um, is interested in, we could come forward with maybe a, a nominal um, increase in the fees at the at Riverside relating to to um, to those two categories, lot sales and burials. Um, so I just throw that out there um, as a suggestion. Uh, the other re relates to um, capital. So Riverside has had multiple phases of development and expansion and it's been um, studied, it has multiple master plans dating back to the early 90s. And um, there are uh, five total phases associated with Riverside. Um, it's been expanded through four phases and there's one remaining phase, phase five, uh, that remains unbuilt at this time. So uh, with working with Deb on lot sales and availability of lots, um, latest estimates, put us out about six years that we'll run out of lots for sale through the first four phases. Um, so what, I've, um, what I'm suggesting in this, through the CIP um, in the next two to three fiscal years is that we start planning for the implementation of phase five, the last permittable phase of the, of the um, facility. And that phase five would develop about 260 new lots. And based on our existing fee structure, that would yield about over years and years, over time, uh, about $191,000 in revenues in sales, lot sales alone. Um, I haven't calculated the burial fees in any of that, but um, something the town should start thinking about. I know it's a six years out uh, window, but um, the comp plan talks about planning for this uh, coming in the future and the, the master plans for Riverside talk about planning ahead and considering that phase five expansion and just being ready for uh, when lots run out. So um, in the CIP, I think I have some design funds for in FY26 and then implementation of phase five in FY27. Um, the other important note is that Riverside has its own CIP and it has its own CIP um, balance, healthy balance. Um, so I believe there's sufficient funds already in place to implement phase five. So it's another conversation for another fiscal year at another finance committee, but um, just wanted to start getting the word out there that that's um, a CIP that we're 
we're looking ahead and planning for. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm curious, I, I, I imagine there's been discussion about the possibility of a columbarium. Is that in the, in the mix of discussions or uh, a columbarium as in some type of structure for putting lots of uh, containers of ashes and so forth? Sure, I think that the, the latest... Probably one way to extend the, the lives so in the, of this uh, uh, good evening, Deborah Lane, Assistant Manager. Um, years ago when we were work, working on the master plan, actually the last two to three, column barriers kind of became the thing to look at. And we did look at that. And at that time, they were so expensive to build, the question was, why are we building it? And the cost that we would have to incur and then charge for the lot sales we didn't think that was the time to do it. The place that they looked at it was at the flagpole. If you were to go in on the Bari Beach Road entrance, the big veteran's flag, um, it would be around that area. But again, at that time, it, you know, and I don't know if costs have come down, you know, at this point, and I don't think we're at the point to look at that, hopefully with, you know, phase five coming in the next two or three years. Uh, we'll have more room. We figure phase five will gain us about five years or so. But certainly it's something that we've looked at and probably as we get down the road, you know, look at that again. Uh, but again, at that point, the expense was just uh, too much at that point. Thank you. Okay. So we can go to the next one then, which is... The Fort Williams. Fort Williams. On page 187. Do you really want to talk about it? <laughs> <laughs> I think this is the last thing for you. <laughs> Save the best for last. Um, so Fort Williams is, is doing very well. Um, just to give you an update on some of the things that have been going on at Fort Williams, you know we had the master plan update in 2021 that was approved, and in that the the committee was then charged with going through the recommendations and prioritizing them and looking at what needed to be done in the park. And um, over the past fiscal year, we came up with the, some of the projects that were are presently in place, and they are the stairway RFP. I don't know if you've been down to the park at all, but the two stairways, one going from where the vendors are um, facing Portland Headlight up to the top of the hill, that stairway is almost complete. Um, looks fabulous, it's a granite stairway, really looks nice in the park. And then they're gonna start on the one at the picnic shelter where they leave the picnic shelter parking lot and go up the hill around the big rock that's there and up to the port, uh, picnic shelter. So that's in process. Um, we were working, you know, one of the things that we wanna do is make the park a four seasonal park and use for the residents of Cape Elizabeth. The pond was a major portion of that and we had the study of the pond and before it can go out to RFP, we want to dredge the pond, obviously, and change the cistern that's at the corner by uh, Shore Road. It's leaking, and so we, that wants, we want to have that replaced. But before we dredge it, we, want to have, we wanted to have the materials tested to know what was going to be dredged from there and whether it was reusable or not. And obviously, that changes the, co the cost quite a bit for the... Um, contractor that comes in and does the work. So the sampling has been taken, the testing is being done, we're waiting for that to come back from Katahdin Analytics, and then it will go out to RFP for the actual dredging and fixes that are there. Um, the pickleball courts, um, though they did a lot of work on that in the fall, and they are just waiting for the asphalt companies and so forth to open up and then they'll be back on it. The expected date of completion in the RFP was in mid-August and I believe that will be a little bit earlier based on how quickly they were able to get things done um, and the weather has been helpful with that. We're doing, redoing the tennis courts and that has been a project that's approved, contracted, and he'll start in the spring as well. So. A lot of good projects going on, focusing on the use uh, for the residents in Cape Elizabeth. 
in this year's budget, we put in um, the playground that we had put in last year. And that group of people were, are very excited to work on that. And some of them were members that were on the committee last year and really wanted to take that on board, even though we hadn't yet got to the process of being approved for, through the budget. But we've had a couple subcommittee meetings already on the, on the playground, and they're coming back with some great ideas on things that we can do looking at some different um, construction options up there and just getting a lot of input. And very nicely, um, we invited Jeff Tarling, who is the tree warden, and he has worked in uh, South Portland and Portland on different playgrounds and had a lot of great input that was very, very helpful. Additionally, we brought, um, at, invited Andrea Southworth, who obviously works with the Friends of Fort Williams, is very closely uh, works with friends of, of with the Fort Wayne's Park Committee and where this playground is going to abut the children's garden We wanted to make sure that we're working in sync with them as well So she's been a part of those subcommittee meetings, too So I think we'll have an, a very nice product when it gets to that point and as Matt said um, some of that budgeting is going to be utilized through the debt services portion of things so that will be helpful um, the, additionally, you'll be getting a presentation at some point very sh soon on the uh, rally for the courts from the, um, the group that raised some funds for additional things at Fort Williams um, at the pickleball courts. They've done a very nice job. They've outlined what they needed to do, and we've got those things in, in motion as well so that when the pickleboard, pickleball courts are open, everybody will be able to use them, and I think they'll be a very nice thing. Some of the other projects that we're looking at for um, this fiscal year, the invasive plant management, we continually work that through a, a contracted service. They come in and they've just come in recently and did a lot of work up by the Goddard Mansion and in front of the Goddard Mansion. Um, it looks, be it's very nicely done. They really work well with, and Andrea works real close with them to make sure that nothing goes awry there. So that's a regular part of our, our budgeting process. The professional services portion that we're looking for is just um, a lot of these projects are getting bigger or more technical, and we wanted to make sure we had the funds allocated to help when we needed it. And so that's what that funding is going to be for, is if we have to reach out to an engineering firm or somebody to help us just write the RFP or get very specific on information, then that's what that will be there for. As stated, the playground. Um, the bleachers, they've been a part of high school graduation for Cape Elizabeth for quite some time. Um, we had a company come out and look at them. It would be very, very expensive to take them out and redo the whole thing. So this is just going to be a way to get them so that they are safe and they last for another period of time. So um, that's what we're going to do for the just some maintenance and make them safe. Um, battery Blair restoration. We've talked about Battery Blair before. It's the focal point and the center focal point to the fort. It's right by the central parking lot. It's the, the fort that you can walk up the stairs and look out at the lighthouse. It has a beautiful view. It's utilized by many, many, many people. Um, it's starting to have the face kind of break off. Um, and so we have had Ethan Ryle, who has done previous work on Battery Blair and the work that's been done on Battery Blair, Come take a look at it. We walked it. Um, he's writing up a report right now on some suggested ways that we can maintain the life of that, that fort, which will be very helpful. Additionally, there is um, railing that's on the top of that. And if anybody walks along that and really looks at the railing, it's probably not the safest railing to have up there. Um, it's amazing, really. That it's, it's, but when you start to work on something, you do have to kind of bring it up to a code that's a little bit more safe. And along the left-hand side, when you're looking at um, the battery, there's stairs there and there's no railing at all. So we're, um, I've been in contact with a vendor who's going to come in and give us a pricing on replacing that at the top and a handrail along the side as well. So we really want to make that a safe place for people to visit. And they're going to go there, so we might as well do what we can to make it maintain that for a period of time. Additionally, the last thing that we asked for in this fiscal year was the ADA mapping of the park. Um, we're continuing to work on the um, Powers Road feasibility study. 
and when they came in, they come in and give us periodic updates on different things that they're looking at, and ADA walkways within the park was something that we looked into, and we realized that we didn't even know what was ADA appropriate within the park right now, so we're gonna get some mapping of that and make sure that we know exactly that we could provide that to somebody if they were come, it would be on our website, and just a whole layout of what was available to people who wanna come to the park. And in my office, we get those calls all day long of where can I go within the park, what is able for a wheelchair to get through, what can this do? So it'll be nice to be able to provide something to people when they call. Those are the projects. Um, from a revenue base, um, the revenue, and I know that it's, as Christy had stated earlier, I think on the project portion of it, the what you look at that says construction services without the explanation is probably not real helpful. <laughs> so we uh, provided the other document that does spell it out a little bit better for you. So um, any of those projects are now broken out by their name next to the construction services. On the revenue, um, the revenue is mainly driven by the bus and trolleys. That's the largest dollar amount that comes in that we are in our portion of the budget. There's also the pay and display money that comes in. Um, that goes into the general fund and then is requested back when we have projects that need to support that. And it also covers the operational costs of the park. So it's not like that's just all out there waiting to come to us. Um, the bus and trolleys, sometimes those are impacted at the beginning of the season, dependent upon the weather and whether or not there's cruises that are coming in or whatnot. So, we're anticipating a good year. I just didn't want to overextend what we thought was going to come in. I think that they will be right in line with what we were this year. The fee has gone up from $200 per bus to $210 per bus for this coming year. Ceremonies, it, the ceremonies and um, picnic, shelter, such, picnic shelter rentals look low for right now, but they start to come in in the second half of this of the year, so we'll see that increase as we get closer and closer to the summer. Um, the concessions, we're happy to say that all four of our locations are going to be staffed this year. Um, three of our regulars, and we have a new one down by Ship Cove Beach, which we're looking forward to. So that will be nice to see as well. So the uh, concessions should be higher than what we anticipated there. The site fees. Um, Beach to Beacon is the major portion in that. That has been going up over the, you know, we've increased Beach to Beacon's fee from 2022, 2023, and 2024 up 10% each year. So this year they're at 32.9, I believe. So then we'll revisit the fees. In the park, we, as a group, as a Fort Williams Park Committee, made a decision to revisit fees every three years. And these fees will be revisited we have the trolley and bus fees through 2025, so we want to make sure that we give them adequate notice when we do increase it, that we had some meetings with them when we originally put the plan into place, and they asked that we give them adequate notice because they have to then charge out for those. So that we'll start to revisit those fees. We did just, um, as Tim mentioned, the um, pay and display fee. We have put it... Um, it will come to you as, as a council for approval for uh, January 1st of 2025 to increase the fees on the pay and display, as well as to have them be year round at pay and display. So that is something that we are proposing that will come to you for your April meeting, so. And. Yes, I didn't mean to spill the beans on that. I just, I just said, watch that meeting. You stole the thunder, Tim, no. <laughs> But that's where the fees stand, that's where the projects stand. I can answer any questions that you have, certainly. Any questions, anyone? All right, thank you, Kathy. Mm -hmm. And then the last one is, who's that? Jeff Jones, Jeff, that'd be me, Mr. That's Chairman. You? Yes, okay. sir, this you is wrap it up. one of the quicker ones you have all night. <laughs> okay. As I, I talked about a little bit earlier, uh, these are revenues that are generated uh, from uh, the investments that have taken place within the town center that uh, took place from the beginning of when the TIF uh, tax increment financing district was established. And so those uh, amounts of new revenue as they're generated are earmarked and set in a specific account. And this is what we anticipate for this year 
as uh, the revaluation comes into play and those numbers have increased, so we're looking at 182. That will be going into that fund for this year's account going forward. All right, any questions? Yes. Where will the balance stand? After, when, with Where will we be, uh, Josh? Um, ballpark. Christy, any thoughts on that? I think she can get. I think she can get a little closer than a ballpark like, on that. The one I didn't yeah. get to. So, if you give me about two minutes, I can probably give you an estimate. I know, in a good portion of that, uh, we had surplus left over that wasn't uh, from segment seven and eight uh, sidewalk project that was done last year, uh, where that project came in under under where we anticipated. So those funds went are going back into the TIF. So we're using those to apply to the town center if that project, you know, if and when that project goes forward. So. Uh, so we put that back in, and so Chris, Chris, you can tell us what we anticipate that to be. A follow up email. I know, I I'm, watching, I'm watching her. I'm watching her. Uh, the, the network not respond as quickly as either one of us would like to see. Yeah. Maybe we, get, maybe we can get yeah, that. A follow up email is fine. We, we can do that. Yeah, we can do that. I, could, I could definitely do that. I hate to be the one standing between <laughs> us and a motion to adjourn. <laughs> I have one more question. Oh, yes, go ahead. Um, we had talked um, over the past few months in um, some of the um, school building advisory committee meetings uh, relative to the, the finance and stuff like that around solar and uh, an expansion of solar at um, up near the transfer station where the other one is. At what point do we kind of put that on the radar? Do we need to have it like a placeholder in here that says, even though there's no dollars associated with it at this point in time, but in order to have it on the radar for a capital improvement um, project, uh, do we want to get it in here? Or is it in here and I didn't see it because the print's so small? It, it's, a, if, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the print isn't, uh, it's not a print size, uh, <laughs> not a font size related incident for one of the few times, Councilor Jordan, uh, in my tenure. Uh, it, I think you could follow that under special studies as we go forward. Uh, okay, so you'll areas. park it in there? We could park it in there, uh, I think, because that's, uh, as, as you go forward, I think to, to move that forward, there, we could house that and fund uh, what needed to take place from there. Because I'm sure that the, um, our energy committee will find that to be a very interesting project to tackle. Yep, I, know, I know Richard Parker's done a lot and he he has. Done a lot of really good preliminary work and he is, by the way, a gift as we've all come to realize more and more. He's just, you know, when we did the original project, he's, he was awesome to work with and uh, he's just been a really, he's just a gift to have as an asset mm -hmm. to help out on, as we've discussed solar issues going forward. That, that committee's done some great work and yeah. having uh, Dave, as a staff person supporting that, that seems to be working really well as well. So, all right, any other? I think a motion to adjourn. So moved. All right, second, is everybody? I'd really like to thank all the department heads that have done such a great job this year. Uh, this is a tough year with the reval and, and uh, getting a budget that came in as well as it did, I think is going to position us in November to get success on our referendum for the building so really really do appreciate uh, how, how hard everybody worked to get this very responsible budget so thanks again Thank you. so Matt will you be pulling together all of the questions and stuff we had and where we need to uh, our circle back stuff yeah. yep, we'll have that ready. I don't have to remember them okay good